Okay, perfect. That will then appear on our channel. So um, do you have any other questions or? Uh, no, I think I can run it as usual, you know, go to the Q&A. Lizzie, I have to do a training for that. Sorry, I was trying to find the webinar and I couldn't find, you know, I feel I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we just need to sit down for five minutes and I'll show you something. Yeah. All right, then. Have Bye a good one. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Lizzie, do I have to do anything or just... Uh... Um, you just need to start it. Oh, right course, start webinar. <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, Maria, again. can you hear me? Yes, okay. yeah, yes. Bye -bye. Is that okay with you? Yeah, can I just uh, check the share screen function that it works properly when I... Uh, yeah, can you just... Uh, it says all the panelists. Can you share? Yeah, yeah I can. I'm, let me just I'm gonna try to... Hal, how are you? Yes, perfect. Okay. All right. Yeah. Seems okay. Good. First of all, guys, thank you very much. I know that became a bit of a going back and forth, going back and forth. I know how busy you are. Uh, I really, really appreciate. I know that you have both to leave earlier, right, Nahal, by before three. Am I right? Oh, yeah, I've got to jump into another meeting at three, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. But, um, no, 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 no. But yeah, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. That's why I started yeah. earlier, you know. So what I'm planning to do is we don't have to, uh, I'm going to give a very short introduction, you know, and just um, highlight some points and then immediately give the floor to you. We don't have to go up to 3.15. We can finish before, you know, depending on uh, the discussion. And uh, take it from there. How are you? Everybody seems to be tired. I don't know. Or is it me that I felt so tired today? And sorry, Maria, uh, I can't quite remember, but could you just remind me the order of the, of the speakers? Uh, I think you can go. It's up to you guys. You know, you can go first or it's just I thought of starting a little bit, you know, like uh, for 10 minutes and then immediately give the floor to you. So basically, it's you and Eliab, you know, in this session until uh, you leave. So I thought that up to 20 minutes maximum and then open the discussion and then you can, you can, we can finish earlier this session. Right, Neha, when do you leave? Uh, so I, I have to jump out at three. So I've got 90 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. me too. Not, okay. not, not much before the scheduled time, but. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, the rest, I know, um, I don't know if uh, Fred will join before or if, uh, uh, Christian has to be in the second session, and uh, I know Devika <laughs> is that. I mean, it's crazy, you know. So maybe you know we will start the three of us and then take it from there, you know. So sure, no problem. Yeah, but you'll give a little introduction anyway, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give the introduction, short introduction, a couple of thoughts. I just finished reviewing um, Clapham's book, War. <laughs> Uh, so, and I was watching yesterday the Russian ambassador on BBC, uh, he gave, a, I don't know if any of you had, uh, uh, Nahal, if you had any chance to, to watch him. There's only a limited number of atrocities I can take every day, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had, a, you had a little bit of tension again, right? A, a little bit in Jerusalem, no? Yeah. Just a bit, I, I just noticed some things over there. <laughs> Yeah, no, these days, you know, whenever every day there's not a complete catastrophe, it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's just... Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if the rest will join, sorry. Uh, but uh, but we can do it like that, you know. And then Yael couldn't, couldn't join and uh, Emily had COVID. So everything, you know, like everybody, I had COVID twice myself, you know, so... It, it... Yeah, also, kind of my paper is really really preliminary thoughts so it's kind of like uh, yeah yeah sure yeah. uh now how would you like to start first Elia, what what do you prefer you know i have I'm completely neutral um i don't mind i mean i'm i'm talking a little bit about the work i'm doing on mm -hmm. uh, tr trying to think about the ways in which integrating the laws of war into ai enabled systems exactly uh, so it's not especially legal in a way it's more trying to think about the problem of the relationship between law and uh, uh, ai so mm -hmm. i don't know whether it, it might be a little abstract yeah i don't know whether it's better to start with something more concrete 
Okay, so Elia, would you like to? I mean, I will start. It will sure. be abstract. But just before that, uh, Nehal is. Is it? I'm really hearing you in a low volume. Is it my problem? Okay. Or could Maria, be, are you okay with? Do you hear uh, Nehal? Could be uh, my uh, computer microphone is not very good. I might have to put on a headset. Hold on. Okay, I, I can hear you, Elia. No, I no, I'm wondering. I hear uh, Nehal very low. He's a little bit long. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just my, concerned for the other participants. Okay. I think um, this surely is better. Okay. Is that any better? No. Um, the no. same. So. I think it's the same as well. Yeah. That's strange, actually, because usually this one has a has a good microphone. Okay. Um, that's the best option that I have. Yeah! 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 Uh, but it'll, maybe it will allow me to speak a little bit less um, uh, sort of uh, strongly. Okay, and then don't worry, I will check the Q&A if there are questions, you know, I'm going to make this round, you know, and uh, you can, all, you, of course, you can check yourselves as well, you know, the, the, the Q&A, and we will finish by, by, by three. Is that okay? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I can see the excitement. Guys, once more, thank you very, very much, really. Um, I, it's good to see you even virtually. So I think I should start the seminar. You know how it goes. Uh, we, we wait. I wait for a couple of seconds and then, you know, oops. Oh, Hello, Christian. Maria, can you just tell me who the participants are? Is it students? Is it what? I mean, it is students, colleagues, we kind of, you know, advertise. Hi, Christian. Uh, it's, um, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a joint uh, crowd as usual. Okay. Yeah. It's a joint crowd. I mean, I send it uh, around, hopefully, you know. Uh, Christian, I just said, you know, that most likely we'll finish a little bit earlier with the first session. And then we can start also, you know, depending on Fred and Devika, we can start a little bit uh, earlier. Is that okay? We don't have to go all one hour and a half for each session, you know? I mean, we will in this time, but Nahal has to leave at three. So we thought of stopping, you know, cutting it at three o'clock and then we can restart uh, 10 past three. Is that okay? That, that's fine. I have to sort of, uh... I mean, I think I listen to Elia and, and Neha when you discuss, I may have to sort of skip briefly into a research committee meeting, but I'll be sure. back from that as soon as I can, if only because it's very, very boring. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so, but it's good to see you. That's to see you. Thank, thanks, Maria. Good to see you, Neha. Good to see you. Oh, thank you all very much. I know these are crazy, hectic times. You know, it went, I went ballistic. It's recorded already, so I shouldn't say anything. It, it never showed, Maria. It never yeah, showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I was very subtle, you know, in my in my <laughs> comments, you know. Uh, I doubt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, I should. Uh, we should better start, as I say. I'm going to introduce, and then I immediately I give the floor to you guys, you know, and uh, a very basic introduction to you. I don't think you need anything. Thank you once more, very very much. Okay. So hopefully I will do. I won't mess up around with uh, with Zoom as always. So we start. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the last uh, online roundtable we have at the War Studies Department on International Law and War. Today, I'm very happy because I'm hosting uh, a couple of friends who happen to be leading experts in what they are doing. And I'm very grateful to all of them for participating in our roundtable. Um, this year, the War Studies Department celebrates its 60 years of its operation. So I thought that international law should play a part in the discourse about the war studies within the war studies department. So what I thought during the last months was to ask uh, my friends and, and colleagues to think about emerging or re-emerging themes they would like more to highlight, to set line in the broader context of war, uh, of the concept of war. 
Now, what I'm going to do during the first session, of course, uh, we will have uh, two panelists. We'll have Professor Nehal Buda from the University of Edinburgh and Professor Eliab Libli from Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law. And initially, I will provide um, a, a short uh, introduction, trying to beat together the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, why do we have an online roundtable or international law and war? And then I will give the floor to my uh, speakers and all the participants can put questions of the Q&A. Of course, uh, Professor Christian Champs is with us. He will talk in, during the second term. Christian, thank you very much for being here. And uh, after the first session, we'll have a very, very short break between three and uh, 10 past three, and then we'll continue with the second session. So uh, the title of, uh, of this roundtable is called International Law and War, Ways of Seeing. And that was my invitation to, to the speakers to, to think, uh, how do they see some particular themes they consider intriguing or emerging or underdeveloped within the context of international law and war? I have to say that being at the War Studies Department, I'm teaching a model called International Law and War. And uh, that motivated my interest because I was thinking, why am I teaching a model called war instead of international law and armed conflict or something else? Yesterday, maybe some of you uh, attended the interview of the Russian ambassador before the BBC, who said, of course, this is not war. Uh, this is not war. This is a limited military operation or a special military operation. And we know whoever calls it war in Russia ends up in prison for spreading false information. But what does, does it really matter to call it war instead of military, um, a special military operation or an armed conflict? What are the implications over there? So having said that, uh, we know, we international legal scholars, that law, especially war, especially the concept of war since 1945, is considered to be an antithesis of international legality. Once I wrote that, and a colleague from another discipline told me, how could you say that war exists? And it's true that we have war, the concept of war in the reality of international law in other subfields. We talk about international humanitarian law, the laws of war. We talk about international criminal law and we talk about war crimes. We talk about the protection of human rights in peace and war times and not only. Hi Fred, it's good to, to, to uh, welcome you uh, in our session as well. So what are the implications of, of war and why do we go back to the concept of war? Here I would like to, to highlight uh, two aspects. First of all, we have seen the language of war being used by almost everyone. And I'm not talking about the last three months, I'm talking before. We have political leaders and laymen uh, claiming all the time that we are at war, whether it was the war on terror or the war against poverty. Of course, there they didn't show the same you know, passion about war. Or when we talk lately about we're at war against climate change. And more recently, you know, we had the war, we are at war with COVID. We saw that. We saw this statement by many leaders for President Macron to other leaders. What does that imply? It, it implies it provides a kind of carte blanche uh, to political leaders to, to declare states of emergencies, whether we talk about de facto or de jure. Uh, it gives them this necessity for the abnormal, for the exceptional, for the particular challenges that they have to divert normality. It gives them more, more power, and we have seen that in many respects. One characteristic example is the European Union and the discourse we had, the war discourse again, when asylum seekers and migrants tried to uh, enter the European Union from Belarus. There we heard again from senior political officers claiming that we are at war. The European Union is at war. Of course, when people started asking, what does it apply legally? So if you are at war, should you exercise you know, self-defense? Are you on attack? Against who? should you exercise this self-defense, it became more problematic. However, the concept and the mentality and the sensibility of war was very much widespread. Because when you say you are a war, you more or less, you, you operate under a Schmittian reality. You know, you have an enemy and that rallies people around this enemy. And that gives more power to the sovereign to decide on behalf of you because we are at war. This is an exceptionality. So setting 
alongside this language of work, which is very problematic, and we will see it again and again, it's also very interesting because we see the, the concept of war as a legal concept that remains very, very persistent. And I, I just uh, said, I talked to my, uh, to my colleagues before, and I say I just reviewed the recent book by Andrew Clapham on war, where Andrew claims that we should outline, that since war, the concept of war, the institutional concept of war, or as, sorry, the concept of war as an institutional uh, concept has been outlawed since 1945, it doesn't make any sense to keep intact particular belligerent rights, you know. So since we outlawed war in 1945, why do you why do we keep these remnants before 1945? We're in a different logic. Uh, in this book, and I, I think it's very, very it's, it's very intriguing because he he pushes the agenda. He makes a very strong normative argument against the concept uh, of of war. Uh, even criticizing the just war theory that is part of the problem because the just war theory justified some kinds of killings, whereas Andrew Clapham says that it doesn't make sense to me, it's a paradox over there. And he talks about war with a capital letter and war with a small letter after 1945 we see that, literally speaking, the concept of war has some impact because in many constitutions domestically, you know, you need to have a proper declaration, a state of war. We have seen that very much with the United States. But also in other domestic spheres, being in a state of war, legally speaking, means, for example, implies particular rights and obligations of the citizen of this state. So the concept of war, legally speaking, is there. And what uh, Andrew Clapham claims in this book is that that this concept of legal war, it's a state of mind. It's a state of mind that actually contributes, facilitates further loosening of uh, fundamental uh, principles, such as the principle of proportionality, or contributes, for example, into enhancing further killing or further detention or further expropriation of property. Uh, I would say that all these things have become very, very interesting and uh, not interesting, relevant the last years and more relevant the last three months. Now, the second point I would like to, to, to highlight here before I stop, uh, no, I have three points, and I think this is very much related to the work of some like Nahal's work uh, is that we keep talking about new types of warfare. We talk about new technologies. We all know that. We talk about hybrid warfare. Uh, and the main question is to what extent the old rules of international law are still relevant? How can we adapt them? How can we use them? Do we need more rules? Is it at the end of the day a matter of law or it's more another matter, especially when we talk about in, um, uh, artificial intelligence, for example? Is it purely a matter of law, or we are talking uh, about uh, basically uh, morality um, and ethics? However, here I would like to say that although we focus so much on new uh, warfare and new types of war, and we have so much discussion, what we have seen during the three months, and maybe uh, um, maybe other uh, participants, you know, can also spot that, is I feel that we go back to the basics. I think the basics have been always there. I was I was surprised, but I'm not a military person. I was surprised to see a ground military invasion, you know, on 21st century on the territory of Ukraine. Everybody was talking about cyber warfare, okay, hybrid warfare. Of course, that doesn't mean that we didn't have incidents of cyber warfare. And then we saw, you know, that we went back to the basics. We had to reread doctrine. We had to analyze doctrine. We had to clarify doctrine. Here, though, so during the last years and months, we have seen lots of scholarship from a historical perspective, and I think Fred will uh, contribute with his uh, intervention uh, here, where to some extent demystifies, you know, some, if I would say, of the myths we had about the creation of international humanitarian law, about the rules of war. I'm talking about the work of Egal Benvenisti, uh, recent books related to making war. Uh, so we are going to see actually to what extent, you know, this rosy picture some of us might had about the rules, uh, the conduct of warfare, uh, where reflective of reality and where do we stand today? 
And the third point I'm going to make, and I'm going to stop there in order to give immediately the floor uh, to Nahal and Eliab, uh, it's very much related to the work I'm doing. And it's about the responsibility we have as international teachers, scholars, and legal uh, um, advisors. So I have seen, and I share this uh, sometimes uh, disappointment, sometimes I would even say cynicism about the role of international law. Does it really matter? We are talking about the indeterminacy, we all know about that. We saw the use and abuse. Uh, and then I wonder, you know, how can we teach international humanitarian law? How can we teach the prohibition on use of force? Uh, how can we avoid cynicism and be critical? What kind of message can we convey? Maybe it's a bit of a patronizing, uh, definitely it is patronizing, but I think there is a, tie, a kind of responsibility that we have when we enter a classroom and we talk to younger people or when we provide legal advice. So this is a question actually I would like to put to all my speakers. Maybe they would like to comment on that, you know, because I know that all of you teach those uh, issues, you have written about about those issues. And I hope you know that uh, you will share your thoughts with me. So having said that, you know, this is my initial introduction and now I would like to give the floor to um, Eliab. Would you like to take first the floor or Nahal? I don't know, it's, it's okay, Eliab already. So thank you very much. Let me just set up here uh, to make sure everything works. So can everybody see my presentation? Okay. Can you see my presentation? Okay. I see your presentation. Yeah, so, sorry about that. Whenever you set up Zoom, it comes up differently. Um, okay, so we said back to basics. So actually my talk is, uh, Back to basics uh, in, in terms of dealing with really uh, basic issues of, of, of war. So as you see my as a title, uh, well, first of all, thanks everyone uh, for uh, uh, attending and Maria for organizing. Um, and I will speak about uh, recourse to force to uh, recover occupied territories and the justification for self-defense. And it's pretty, uh, the initial stages of thinking about this problem, but it really, Kind of curious and 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 uh, and confused where these uh, this question is taking us. So I would be happy to get your your input. Um, so I will begin by really discussing the problem. I will uh, mention the ongoing doctrinal debate about this question. I'll try to kind of put it in a theoretical context, and then try to really in a preliminary way think about okay, how do we understand law under this competing uh, normative intuitions that that we might have about this uh, uh, question. Okay, so let's begin with the problem, right? So imagine that A, an aggressor state, occupies territory belonging to state B, and then hostilities end, but A remains in control of the territory. Now imagine that after years, maybe decades, uh, B goes to war to, to recover the territory. And I call these wars, wars of recovery for lack of a, a shorter uh, way to uh, label them. And doing so, it kills people such as AIDS soldiers and civilians caught as collateral damage. It also occasions harm to its own soldiers and, and civilians. So would such resort to force be legal or should it be legal? And uh, Maria, Maria said back to basics. So these questions are far from theoretical nowadays. So the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh uh, was precisely this uh, situation, the Golan Heights, Northern Cyprus, uh, Crimea, and maybe parts of Eastern Ukraine, uh, if uh, uh, Russia gets what it wants, uh, might you know, uh, uh, um, set up this dilemma again. Okay, so this, this question, if we look at doctrine, and I will say a few things about it in a bit, it's inconclusive, and it was in the heart of a recent debate by leading international lawyers. And there is a permissive view that argues that passage of time alone cannot elapse the right to self-defense. And generally speaking, as long as territory is held by another state, there can be necessity for using force to recover it. An opposing restrictive view holds that once hostilities subside and an unspecified amount of time uh, passes, necessity for self-defense uh, ceases. And like many doctrinal questions in international law, I think the answer is inconclusive. And when thinking about you know, what should law be here, I think our normative intuitions are torn, or at least mine are. I think most of us, you know, if we take 
state's territorial integrity seriously, it seems arbitrary that just because time has passed, B loses its right to recover the territory. Moreover, wouldn't it provide a perverse incentive for aggressors to hold on territory? On the other hand, we also think that you know, war is intrinsically bad. After all, you know, killings have stopped and have not been going on for a long while, let's assume. So it seems strange simply to permit the resumption of hostilities in a later point of time. And furthermore, in a world where territorial disputes are abound, wouldn't such a result, uh, rule result in rampant, rampant abuse? Uh, so this paper explores these uh, torn intuitions and asks, so what do we have to believe in order to believe in either one of these approaches? And, uh, and, and, and then how, how to think about law in such uh, uh, indeterminate or inconclusive situations. So first of all, I want to avoid the easy answer and kind of distill the dilemma. So when this easy answer would be that, you know, war is indeed bad, but prolonged occupation is hardly better. It usually involves gross human rights violations and violations of self-determinations. And, and this pu pushes us towards the permissive view. Usually when a state seeks to recover long lost territory, there, it's more than just about territory. It's also about the infringement of certain rights. But to isolate the dilemma, assume that A is a relatively benign state, perhaps it even offers equal citizenship to the occupied population, Maybe even the local population prefers to be ruled by A since B is a cruel dictatorship. Maybe they have historical connections with A or assume that the occupied territory is generally uninhabited. So this assumption brings us back to square one. Should recovering territory per se, absent of ongoing hostilities or atrocities justify resort to force? And, and to answer this, we need to grapple with the basic questions on the justification for interstate self-defense. Um, and I think it's a manifestation of the greater dilemma on the ultimate subjects of international law. Is it the state as territorial unit or the individual qua bearer of individual rights? So let's discuss the doctrinal debate for a bit. So the legal question is pretty simple, right? The qu question is whether an ongoing occupation, absent ongoing hostilities, amounts to an ongoing armed attack that gives a, right, uh, a rise to a right to, to self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter, right? And the recent debate on this question, question was sparked by the Nagorno-Karabakh War of 2020, in which Azerbaijan sought to recover territory occupied by Armenia for 25 years. And it was, there was also an, an armistice agreement in place. And we'll discuss this in a bit. So in a series of publication, uh, Tom Ruiz and uh, Felipe Rodriguez Silvestre on one hand, and Dapo Akande and Antonio Stenokopoulos on the other, reached strikingly opposing conclusions. And the fact you know that such uh, leading international lawyers would <laughs> reach these uh, uh, completely opposing conclusion says something about uh, the inconclusive, inconclusivity of, of, of law on this question. So uh, Ruiz and Rodriguez uh, Sylvester defend the restrictive view, the restrictive view. And they argue that uh, we have to inquire about the meaning of an armed attack under Article 51. And even if there is an armed attack, uh, armed attack necessity requires that it's gonna be ongoing. And prolonged occupation to Ruiz and, uh, and Rodriguez Sylvester it's not an ongoing armed attack, right? What we have is a prolonged status quo, which is actually closer to a territorial dispute. And once we have a territorial dispute, right, even if it's in the form of an occupation, there is no longer an ongoing armed attack. There is no necessity for self-defense. In this case, they argue, what applies is the principle of non-use of force to settle territorial disputes. Right? So in such a situation, you have to go to the Security Council, you have to offer negotiations, um, or peaceful settlements uh, of dispute um, uh, largely, right? So continuous occupation is just a case of uh, territorial dispute. And as they argue, and specifically in the context of Nagorno-Karabakh, but that's, this was, would also apply to the Golan Heights, for instance, the case for this is strongest when you have an armistice agreement. How do they reach this conclusion? So they go to the uh, UNGA Declaration of uh, Friendly mm -hmm. Relations, Right, and uh, this declaration defines what would be an unlawful use of force inter alia. And it says that every state has a duty to refrain from a threat or use of force to violate international lines of demarcation, such as armistice lines, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if we have an armistice lines, uh, line, this is even uh, a stronger case um, to argue that continued uh, occupation of holding of territory um, is, uh, sorry, uh, lapses necessity for self-defense. And they also make some policy justifications, uh, which are kind of, I mean, so I think it's 
less from uh, ethics, but more kind of a legal policy justification. So one, um, they argue that uh, under a permissive view, right, the right to self-defense could just be revived at any point, which would cause uncertainty and instability. And every territorial dispute could be rephrased by the other party as an unlawful occupation, right? So this would completely undermine uh, the prohibition on the use of force, right? And in that context, right, um, if we adopt the, the, the restrictive view, I mean, their view, um, states would not be able to invoke now uh, claims of self-defense against territorial disputes in the distant past, going back even decades or more, right? So their argument is more mostly about uh, uncertainty, stability, and less about justice or, or ethics, right? So this is one uh, part of the, uh, of the argument. The other view, which I call the permissive views by Dapo Kande, and then uh, Antonio Tsanakopoulos. So their, their argument is the complete opposite, right? So, so to them, um, continuous occupation, which results from an armed attack is just part and parcel of that attack, right? So if this is true, so necessity for self-defense persists as long as the occupation exists, right? The passage of time cannot change this, uh, on the opposite, you know, uh, the, the opposite might be true. The passage of time just reveals that the occupant is, has no intention of returning the territory, right? So in this context, they argue a prolonged occupation is not a territorial dispute subject to the principle of non-use of force, right? Um, uh, what, what they argue is that you can distinguish between genuine territorial disputes, right? And territorial disputes and, and situations of prolonged occupation. And the way to distinguish them between these situations is by asking whether the territory was previously held by another state in the era of the UN charter, in which force became clearly unlawful. Only in such cases, the right to self-defense kicks in to begin with, right? So all other, you know, ancient disputes about territory uh, pre-UN charter would not, uh, will fall under territorial disputes. Occupations resulting from uses of force post-charter, they can be uh, viewed as uh, continuous armed attacks, right? And in terms of, you know, doctrine or, or, or in conceptual terms, um, so they look at the definition of aggression, of the UN General Assembly, and they show that it defines unlawful occupation as a type of aggression, and aggression correlates, correlates with, the nation, with the notion of armed attack. Therefore, ongoing occupation is ongoing armed attack. So it's a very conceptual argument, right? So regarding armistice agreements, uh, interesting, interestingly, they say, well, you know, armistice agreements, they don't negate necessity forever, right? Because they say that uh, such agreements do not alter the uh, temporary character or change the status. So, so once it becomes clear that the armistice, armistice is treated as something permanent, right? Maybe if uh, the occupant annexes the ter territory is unwilling to discuss uh, returning it, so then you know necessity uh, uh, is revived, right? So it's not about uh, armistices don't just uh, negate necessity forever. In terms of justifications, Right, so they also make uh, instru instru instrumental arguments. So they say, well, um, the permissive uh, position does not reward aggressors, right? Because the restrictive uh, uh, approach would, you know, provide incentive for states to occupy territories and remain in control. And in this sense, it enhances stability, right? Because uh, states would have less of an incentive to occupy territory. Second. They argue that their view reduces uncertainty because under the uh, restrictive view, it's unclear at what point an occupation becomes prolonged, which uh, elapses the necessity for self-defense. So they say, well, uh, under our view, you know, self-defense is available to, to the entire uh, period of an ongoing occupation. Now, to me, uh, the, 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 the doctrinal debate is, is, is pretty limited. Uh, I think it's a bit unsatisfying. Um, so, First of all, you could see the completely opposite interpretations of practice uh, provided by, by both approaches. I won't get into it, but both of them learn completely opposite uh, uh, conclusions from, uh, from this uh, 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 from practice. Second, I think that each position really kind of undermines the other, right? And on the, on the same level of argument. So each points out the uncertainty in the other, and I won't repeat the, the, the arguments here. Uh, each position's instrumental arguments cancel each other out, right? So each one says that the other position will incentivize aggression, and we have no uh, way to really find our way out of it. But I think 
perhaps most importantly, or I think most interesting thing, and this is kind of what drives my motivation um, to discuss this, is that each position is really undermined by a competing principle from within the international legal system each, itself, right? So the restrictive view can be challenged by international laws, emphasis on territorial integrity as the basic kind of unit of self-defense. Well, the permissive view can be challenged by invoking uh, the human costs of renewed war. And, and this, you know, of course, uh, invokes uh, human rights, right? So this really boils down to, I think, a normative dilemma. What is self-defense for? What is, it, what is it necessary for, to defend territory, territory as such or to defend uh, life, right? And of course, the former pushes to the permissive view why, uh, while the latter might, might uh, push to the restrictive view. And here, I think, you know, that it can be really interesting to kind of take a, uh, a step back and think of it in terms of, of ethics, uh, ethics of war or ethics in general. So when, when we think about, you know, what would be the normative, uh, you know, axis to think about, about uh, uh, wars of recovery. So I think there are three. One is the axis of stability, the other, the axis of killing, and the third, the axis of sacrifice. So let me kind of just go through them. So the axis of stability, here the question would be, to what extent would it be justified to alter the status quo in order to recover territory? And I think in here, both uh, uh, positions argue against each other. And ultimately, I think this level of argument cannot be determinative for several reasons. First, because stability is a factual concept and it doesn't have independent moral worth, uh, I think it's a proxy for protecting other values uh, like life. So I think that that should be our, our focus. The other uh, reason why I think the axis of stability is less uh, uh, pertinent is because it's really problematic to uh, decide questions of life and death on the basis of incentives, right? I'm allowed now to go to, to go to war of recovery to incentivize or disincentivize other aggressors. That would be using people as means, right? So there's a, there's a real problem in, in in making the argument about, about incentives. So the, the, the main questions I think are about the axis of killing and sacrifice. So the axis of killing would ask, would it be justified or necessary to kill people in order to recover territory held by another state uh, for decades? And here, I think, you know, the traditional view would be, yeah, of course it is. Uh, the traditional view uh, looks at, you know, states as some kind of a quasi individual and the ter territory is imagined as Part of the body of the state, you know, we can uh, um, uh, portray it that way. And if uh, the territory is part of the body, right? So whenever it's held, you know, there's real uh, compelling interest to act in self-defense, right? And, and this view, I think, has significant pedigree in, in classic international law. But I think it also can't be the end of the analysis. And, and we think that wars of recovery might be somehow uh, different. And here, you know, a possible explanation for some of our, of our counter intuitions can be found in revisionist approaches to the ethics of war that question the premise that defending national territory as such justifies killing. And in these, and in, 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 in such, in general, such th theories refuse to ascribe to territory the same value ascribed to human right, uh, life. So the argument would be um, that in wars of recovery, this is particularly the case because in usually in usual uh, situations of territorial defense, the aggressor attacks through ongoing use of kinetic weapons. And so it's much easier to reconcile territorial, territorial self-defense with the immediate defense of life. But in wars of recovery, it is the defender that it initiates the fighting at that specific moment. And in such cases, the protection of territory and the defense of life become disentangled. And so in, in ethics of war, there is a, a very interesting hypothetical called the bloodless invasion. And this is a situation in which the aggressor wants the territory, but will only resort to killing if encountering resistance. Right? And so there's a classic moral dilemma in ethics of war, whether it's permissible to resort to killing in situations of bloodless invasions in order to defend territory. And I think that the continuous holding of territory is actually a real life example of what is usually presented as a hypothetical of bloodless invasion. Right? And I think this also allows us to better understand the normative significance of time, because as time passes, it becomes less likely that absent further intervention, killing will be renewed. Right? So time to here serves as a proxy for the reduced likelihood of uh, violence. So, so, so some theorists of, of uh, revisionist uh, just war theories um, argued that, well, there can be absolutely no justification 
uh, for killing to secure rights or in interests that are lexically inferior to the right to life. So on this view, right, recourse to force uh, against bloodless invasion, among them continuous uh, occupation is clearly wrong because you would kill people to uh, recover uh, territory. But this is not the end of the story, right? So to see how the debate uh, becomes uh, complicated, right? On the, other, on the other hand, some revisionists pro uh, propose to view defense of territory, even in bloodless scenarios, as situations uh, that are called conditional threats. So conditional threats are basically like street muggings. A demands of B to suffer a lesser harm, your money, under the threat that re resistance will generate a much greater harm, your life. So defense of territory is not justified as such, but it can be viewed as a defense against a conditioned threat against individuals. In other words, it, it's the preemptive defense against the aggressor's lethal response to an attempt to reclaim the territory that justifies killing. And prolonged occupation could be easily uh, conceptualized as a conditional threat, right? So state A, state A took territory by force and now demands of state B to tolerate the loss of its occupied territory under the threat that any attempt to recover it would result in a lethal uh, response. And I think the view of the conditional threat really goes a long way to, to, to uh, um, justify the permissive view on the level of the axis of killing. But then uh, we are uh, um, uh, met with the axis of sacrifice, right? And here the question is, is it justified to risk and occasion harm to your own people to recover territory. And again, here, you know, traditionalism is oblivious to the question because resort to war is perceived as strictly an interstate issue. But again, here, uh, revisionism uh, really this destabilizes this uh, argument. So for instance, Rodin says that in interstate settings, a conditional threat cannot give a rise to a right to self-defense because what we're doing here is we act against a deprivation of a lesser interest, the territory, and while doing it, we occasion harm to the greater, greater interests, e.g., life of people we owe a special people to which we owe a special duty of care, namely our soldiers and civilians. Right. So under this approach, there is no way to justify self-defense against bloodless invasions, among them continuous holdings of territory, without, you know, an analogy of the state to an individual, which the revisionists uh, um, don't agree with. So this pushes us back to the restrictive view. So I'm, kind of, I'm out of time, so I'll skip a few things. I just wanna say that I think, you know, this question really evokes several levels of uncertainty, right? So both uncertainty of, of who is the su ultimate subject of, of, of uh, rights in international law, states or individuals, and um, the, the, the moral uncertainty regarding the permissible, permissibility of resort to force against bloodless invasions or conditional threats. And then the open question is, well, assuming that we can't resolve this uh, dilemma, uh, what should law do? And here, you know, it's really a, kind of a preliminary argument, but one way perhaps is to kind of just recognize that we can't agree about uh, the normativity of this uh, question. And therefore, maybe uh, treat the questions of wars of recovery as something which is non prohibited, that, that law does not necessarily prohibit, but also provides a space for condemnation. And this is something that, you know, I'd be happy to debate it's really in the initial stages. Um, so thanks. Sorry for racing, but uh, I had uh, time constraints. So thanks, everyone, and looking forward. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya. Um, I think you can, yes. Yes, thank you very, very much. Wow, I don't know to what extent I was back to basics. It was and it wasn't, actually. Uh, Fred, have you raised your hand uh, already? Yeah, I have. Is that what we're supposed to do? Uh, well, the idea was like to give the floor first to Nahal and then take a... Oh, sure. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Just okay. my enthusiasm to get... Okay, to I, 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 can, I can see that. Actually... Uh, I think, uh, Maria, given that because there's a lot in Eliav's discussion, it might be better. Okay, to okay. Just, yeah. just, just a quick one, one, you know, yeah, just okay, a quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry to interrupt the transition. Eliav, this is a fantastic uh, project. I mean, I think uh, uh, it's super topical. There's a sense in which I'm interested in the kind of epistemological question, right? What do we do? Uh, which is, of course, an old question. What do we do when the law is uh, hopeless to resolve um, normative dilemmas? And, and of course, the move to uh, 
ethics, you know, uh, specifically just war theory and the kind of the best philosophical work that's out there. Uh, and, you know, with all our qualms and ambivalence as lawyers to uh, engage this, you know, the realization that uh, philosophers unconstrained by narrow uh, interpretative exercises are sort of often way ahead of us in terms of a their nimbleness, right, and their ability to sort of really engage the normative issues. Whereas I think, you know, the the uh, the existing law controversy I find a bit stale, right? I mean, the idea of the whole thing on armistice, etc., and you know, just taking something from, I mean, I mean, just just these interpretive exercises are really limited for these kinds of situations. One thing that's really cra crazy is that this issue hasn't come up before. So um, one um, argument I'd like to make is, in some ways, um, the uh, you know recovery, self-defense's recovery, radicalizes an even bigger problem, uh, which I'm uh, currently uh, working on, as, as as you know, which is in the context of Ukraine. Like what 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 it, uh, of a case where you're actually defending your uncontested territory, and as you know, this has been. Uh, really in the in the headlines, at least in the background. Uh, but I mean, I think even Zelensky has to address some of these questions, right? I mean, uh, 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 and Donbass and and you know even Crimea, right? Haven't been lost for that long. Uh, so and and there, there's a case, but of course the Russians, from a public international law point of view, have clearly reactivated the right of self-defense in you know in 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 the very short term. But even there, there's a question of, you know, the extent to which you're willing to sacrifice lives uh, to reconquer territory. My own inclination is, and uh, I've uh, shared a, a draft with you on this, is that, I mean, I think it, it serves us well to, to take seriously the just war theory debate. But I think there's, there's something to be said for kind of uh, trying to have these conversations within human rights as a sort of uh, membrane between positive international law and just war theory imperfect as it is, etc. But um, you know, obviously, these are core constitutional uh, issues that involve the state's authority to uh, solicit sacrifice, right, and on which human rights, one would think would have quite a lot to say. Now, it may not be, I think we need probably to move beyond sort of uh, the kind of red lines that we had uh, ambitioned, you know, in, in 1945, would, would, uh, delineate for use uh, contra bellum uh, towards something that's much more in the nature of the law helping us think through difficult issues rather than telling us whether something is legal or illegal, right? Uh, and that's very different. And, and of course, that's, you know, part of a tradition, international law, uh, obviously, of, pe of people, you know, uh, not in a European vein, you know, who think that the law is, is, is not, uh, is, is not conducive to bright lines, but nonetheless is very useful in the way it kind of spells out the normative stakes uh, in some of these difficult decisions. So yeah, thanks a lot, Elia, really great. Okay, uh, thanks also, uh, Fred. Uh, we always tend to kind of be interested in the same things at the same time. So I was really happy to, to get your, your draft today. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have, I agree. I don't have much to add, but I, I do think, yeah, if you can see here on, on, on the, uh, the slide that I think there are traces, let's call it in legal doctrine that starts uh, thinking about sacrifice. Um, and then I'm looking forward to reading your paper because I'm, I'm sure it can you know, be placed here um, in, this, in this discussion. Yeah, so thanks for, for that. Uh, thank you, Eliav. I saw you put general comment over there, 36, and I remember, you know, your 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 paper about the humanization of uh, of uh, your critique of the humanization of uh, user bellum. Um, there is one more question here, um, uh, Nahal. Should I take one more short question and then give you the floor? Because I'm saying that because Nahal has to leave at three. That's why. So Brian, I can see that you raise your hand, please. No? Okay. I thought I had one more hand. Okay. Uh, yes, Brian, you can take the floor. Maybe you cannot hear us. Or if you want, you can write 
Uh, no, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Mm, because, sorry, because we cannot hear you. Maybe you can, we, you can draft your question. Is that okay? On Q&A and then I will read it afterwards. So great. Uh, so since we don't have any other urgent question or comment now, we'll give the floor to Nahal and they will come back with a question. So Elia, thank you very much. Already massive food for thought and uh, uh, we will uh, come back very soon. So thank you. Nahal, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Maria. Just making sure everybody can hear me clearly. There were some sound issues before. Can you hear me? Uh, it's it's a little bit um we can we can yeah. yes okay. it's yeah. low but we can yes yes i'm sorry there's not much i can do about that i don't know what's happening but i'm i'm using the the best headset i have available so if you can't hear me at any point just let me know okay so thank you very much for the opportunity uh to participate in this webinar thank you to maria for the invitation and to uh, all of those who are joining us today um i wanted just to, to talk well, not very long maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh, about um, what is essentially a, a follow-up to the work that I did a few years ago on autonomous weapon systems. Uh, and just to put that in context, um, you know, five or six years ago when uh, I, I organized a sort of research conference on some of the issues arising from autonomous weapon systems, uh, the, the consensus of a lot of the uh, the people who specialize in informatics who were there, the computer scientists, uh, was that at that point in time, um, the technology was still fairly immature, uh, particularly in relation, for example, to things like computer vision, uh, and also in relation to uh, what we would now call machine learning. Uh, and of course, one of the most dramatic developments, I think, of the last six or seven years has been the sense in which there has been a, a radical uh, acceleration in capacities uh, in those fields, which makes autonomy in the form of what, what we gloss as artificial intelligence, uh, which usually refers to, to a particular uh, kind of machine learning uh, using particular kind of computational uh, techniques such as uh, neural nets and deep learning, that, that this thing that we have started to call artificial intelligence um, is uh, now uh, a, tech a technological capacity that, um, oh, this is too low according to somebody. Yeah, let me try something else here. Let me get my, okay. all right, is this any better? Yes. That's better, okay. So clearly my headphones are not working. So let me return to where I was. So um, the point that I was making is that our, uh, our technological horizon uh, seems to have shifted relatively quickly uh, in terms of uh, the expectations that we have uh, about uh, machine learning uh, and uh, what we gloss as artificial intelligence. Right? And for those of you, I'm sure many of you know, the term artificial intelligence is actually held to encompass a wide variety of different kinds of uh, technology. Some of it is a sort of a logical symbolism. Um, well, it's, these days, what we mean really uh, when we speak of that term is uh, sort of accelerated forms of learning which characterize sort of very large amounts of data, uh, data patterning, data processing, the, under, the perception of patterns from that data which allow then quite um, in some ways startling uh, levels of uh, um, uh, pattern recognition uh, leading to uh, judgments and forms of uh, recommendation. So all of this is to say that I think, um, again, we've, from the normative perspective, it seems clear that uh, many countries in the world have uh, demurred when it comes to the question of uh, a full-fledged autonomous weapon system. They say publicly, at least, uh, that they believe in something called meaningful human control, um, a term, of course, which uh, is difficult to define, but it has no legal definition, but it's certainly something that many states talk about and write policy papers about uh, and exchange views about, um, but that ultimately they resist or won't accept uh, the possibility of, of pure autonomy in a weapon system, which they define in a relatively narrow way uh, as uh, the capacity, the autonomous capacity of uh, the system to select 
uh, a target and to make a decision as to the use of force against that target. So if that's what we mean by an autonomous weapon system, uh, there's many views of states that would suggest that they don't believe that that is uh, desirable or acceptable. Mm, I'm not sure they would go so far as to say that it's unlawful, uh, but they don't. Um, uh, they don't. They themselves don't commit to the idea that they should be developing those things or that they would like to develop those things. So, so at, at the same time, this uh, capacity that we've described as we now describe as artificial intelligence. Um, let's call it machine learning using uh, sophisticated techniques uh, such as uh, neural nets, um, has uh, advanced perhaps faster than, than uh, many five or six years ago would have anticipated. Uh, and it generates uh, a, an impressive capacity uh, to, uh, to identify uh, certain kinds of things, characteristics, to absorb large amounts of data generated by, by all sorts of different kinds of sensors and to relatively accurately uh, 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 discern uh, things such as faces, uh, um, uh, complex speech patterns. So there's been a gigantic leap forward in natural language processing, which again was, uh, I think, quite unexpected uh, a mere six or seven years ago. So all of this points to the question of uh, how do we think about the relationship between this and uh, forms of defense technology? And what would that mean for the legality of that technology? How do we evaluate the legality of that technology? Um, I think in the early stages of the uh, autonomous weapons debate, there was an awful lot of um, uh, perhaps all too easy conclusions about legality one way or the other, right? There was this strong claim that no, it couldn't be legal uh, because it was somehow uh, inconsistent with human dignity. Um, uh, Eliav, in fact, has contributed to a paper uh, uh, which, is, which is a version of that argument, uh, which argues that there must in some say, sense be an element of human discretion. Uh, um, and there are others who very, um, uh, I think, uh, also somewhat rapidly reached the conclusion that legality per se was not a problem, provided we could always be assured that the weapon would behave legally. Right. Now, um, I think the difficulty with with either of those positions, of course, is in a sense it's it's speaking from a kind of it's or it's articulating a position in relation to to these capacities, um, which is either ex ante or ex post. Right? That, that either we can establish a sort of first principle, um, which is the real touchstone of legality, or we can ex we can maintain the existing principles, but really know with some sense of clarity and determinacy exactly how the system is going to behave. Uh, under all relevant conditions uh, in order to evaluate its legality. And the, so the work that seems to me interesting uh, and perhaps a, 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 richer, a, a richer terrain for exploration and to which I've, I've been working in a sort of advisory capacity uh, here in the United Kingdom is really, well, what if states are increasingly developing um, AI-enabled uh, weapons capacities, which are not in themselves weapons, but are still uh, making a contribution to hostilities in the manner that would render them susceptible to Article 36 review. Right? As you know, um, the compliance of, uh, of a, uh, um, a weapon or weapon system or a means or method of warfare uh, with international humanitarian law, uh, all, all signatories to Article Additional Protocol 1 uh, commit to the idea that they will review everything that they develop before they field it in order to satisfy themselves that the weapon system or the, the, the means or method of warfare is in fact uh, um, compliant with the principles of international humanitarian law. Uh, and uh, this is an interesting puzzle, I think. What would that review look like? not in relation to a weapon per se, but into a means or method of warfare that, for example, engages in forms of recommendation, such as tactical movement, uh, identification of threats and risks, uh, differentiates, uh, perhaps using things like facial recognition technology between persons who are of interest and who are not of interest. I mean, this is still somewhat one or two steps short of something like target identification, although it could quite easily slip into that, um, but it's definitely making a contribution uh, to uh, the conduct of hostilities 
uh, and therefore would fall within the means and method of warfare, which is amenable to, and indeed should be, reviewed under Article 36. And uh, if you ask in those terms, the question is, how do you know that this system and the people using it can be confident uh, that it, it complies with the requirements of international humanitarian law? That's a question in some sense you have to ask, you're legally obligated to ask under Article 36 of the Additional Protocol, but what would that look like? What would that process of review look like? Um, one of the challenges, I think, of uh, developing sort of these very complex artifacts, these very complex technological artifacts with these capacities built into them, um, is that under very standard procurement processes, uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of Ministry of Defense legal advisors are not really called upon to give an opinion uh, until quite late in the day, once a system is, uh, is being prototyped, uh, once certain parameters of its performance are established, uh, and uh, it's presented uh, towards the end of that uh, to the legal advisor uh, for a judgment as to whether it complies with the laws of war or international humanitarian law requirements. With, with systems of this kind, I just want to see if I can give you an example of what the life cycle development of a system like this might look like. Let me see if I can um, share my screen. Hold on. Um, Uh, I think I can actually. Um, never mind. Uh, I think I'm not a host. Maybe you have to make me a host. I uh, think it says all panelists can. Uh, okay, let me try again. Sorry. Yeah. Just because this is an interesting uh, document to look at in this context. Hold on, let's try that again. Um, Okay, I might have to pass on this for the simple reason that it's going to be a bit too involved. But the basic point that I wanted to demonstrate um, was that uh, artif artifacts, technological artifacts, which such as recommender systems, right, or um, systems that make uh, recommendations about uh, tactical driving, or, or um, even things that do that, that make recommendations about uh, efficient usage of resources. Um, you know, all of these things have are, are sort of systems of systems. Right? They're systems of um, hardware, you know, uh, and they're systems of software, and then they are uh, uh, connected, networked to systems of data creation and production, which must constantly update themselves uh, in order to function effectively in these in in changing environments. So the, the complexity of those systems is very significant. Uh, they go through multiple and highly nonlinear processes of development and technological change and review in the process of prototyping, such that by the time, if you allow the, the question of sort of legal legality and legal review to be left to the end, uh, it's very likely that the legal advisor is not really in a position to say terribly much, right? Uh, uh, and uh, some of the legal advisors that I've spoken to about this in the British context uh, reflected on this in, in relation to legal review of very advanced fighter jet capabilities. In the end, they said, you know, the, the pile of documentation that we received was about three or four foot high. We were not really in a position to do anything except take, take at face value uh, the technological judgments of those who produced that documentation, documentation engaged in testing. So that's fine, I suppose one might say, for a, for a fighter jet at some level. Um, but uh, if the system is, uh, that, we, that, we're in, that we're talking about is making quite complex recommendations to a human operator, it does raise a specter about the responsibility and agency of the human operator, but also the circumstances under which they can be comfortable and confident, uh, trust in a sense, in uh, the, the legality of that system, in the way in which it uh, 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 draws inferences from all sorts of data sources, in the integrity of the data that's used in the first place, 
in the learning models that are used in order to create the frameworks for recommendation. I mean, you can see already that there's multiple uh, um, layers and multiple dimensions in which there, there could be quite a lot of fragility, uh, but in also in which, in respect of which assurance is needed, uh, not simply that the system kind of functions and does what its developers say it's going to do, but in some sense, the way it's set up to function is, broadly speaking, within uh, the space of legality uh, that we uh, believe it should uh, be in. Um, and so this, so this raises all sorts of, I think, uh, interesting and somewhat deep questions about, first of all, the relationship between technical standards and legal norms in humanitarian law. Right? So, uh, you know, the, the legal norm for the safety of an aircraft in civilian uh, usage uh, is really set by an engineering standard, which is considered to be an acceptable practice. Right? So in the course of some of this work, I've had interesting conversations with um, uh, aircraft safety engineers who tell me, well, the, the standard we all operate by is 10 to the minus 9. Every time you get on an aircraft, there is a 10 to the minus 9 chance that it will fall out of the sky and crash. Um, but we can't eliminate that, but we consider that to be safe. Right? Well, what's the standard, as it were, for failure or the acceptable risk of failure in any one of these systems uh, or in the interaction of these systems that could characterize uh, a, um, uh, uh, an AI-enabled recommender system? Um, that in itself is unclear right? because the, uh, there's no um, uh, uh, available standards which are generally accepted across different defense forces and across different industries. We are still in the process of assembling those things, and it's something of a bricolage to do that. Um, but secondly, how does that level of safety relate to the le to legality? Right? That's uh, we in civilian uses we, we use the principle of negligence, right? The reasonable uh, the reasonable uh, manufacturer, um, uh, but we've not, I think, developed any real uh, um, uh, uh, way of articulating what we think is the relationship between the legal standard and the technical standard uh, in the development of these kinds of systems that could have uh, kinetic application. So um, it, this is not to suggest any straightforward answer to this. It's simply to point to, I think, what is an important uh, a set of, uh, well, sort of some interesting theoretical points and some, I think some interesting practical points. So, so I think the theoretical point is, one might say, um, in the interaction or, or the, the concept of legality itself here is not found so much in the text of any given norm, um, but in the relationship between the law and the technology itself, which is mediated by human beings, which by lawyers and technologists. Uh, so there's some interesting sense in which I think there's a horizon of development of the norms that, that will emerge, um, how quickly I don't know, uh, but that will emerge through uh, the extent to which uh, lawyers, technologists, government officials, procurement specialists, contract agents form part of a kind of uh, connected uh, social technical system. Uh, and if we try to understand what legality means in the evaluation of an artificial intelligence enabled artifact, we are actually needing to ask the question, what's the nature of the social technical system that made it? And are we satisfied with the many, many choices that will have been made? in the process of constructing that system. And if we're not satisfied, then we, we have a basis, as it were, uh, to question legality. But it's very hard to do so, if you could imagine. Right? It's very opaque. Uh, it's the proverbial uh, black box of science and technology studies of which uh, much has been written. Um, so, so that's a theoretical observation. And, and it, but it poses a fundamental normative problem at the level of questions of responsibility and explainability. So explainability has become a kind of a uh, fashionable um, uh, dimension, I think, of a lot of discussions of artificial intelligence. Can you explain the decision? Um, I think that is an interesting puzzle, and it's a puzzle especially for the operator, right? If the operator in a certain context is made a recommendation, but they don't have any sense of how the recommendation was derived at, they may simply mistrust it. Now, the recommendation could be the right one, or it could be the wrong one. The problem is that when, you, when humans don't trust machines, then um, in, you know, in some sense, the machine is, uh, uh, is functioning inadequately and, and becomes a liability rather than something that's supposed to assist human decision making. Uh, but how do you know? If you're an operator, how do you know whether you should trust the machine? Who's explained it to you? Uh, on what basis could you evaluate or second guess uh, its recommendation? Should it provide that information to you? 
So that's the kind of the, the operator side. But explainability has a bigger dimension here, I think, and, I, and this is why I think looking at this in the, from the perspective of a, of a socio-technical system is terribly important. Um, looking backwards, we must be able to explain not just why in one instance a human and a machine are operating together uh, resulted in a certain kind of action which had good or bad consequences, right? Which resulted in killing civilians or you know, imprisoning the wrong people or uh, etc. But we also need to explain how it was possible ultimately, how all the human judgments that made that possible came to be and whether we were satisfied with that chain of just of judgments and decision making which really begins from the from the outset at the conceptualization of the technology and goes all the way through its preliminary specifications you know it's it's um uh it's various dimensions of its use case the identification of its data sources uh the, you know the uh, judgments that are made about how much fragility is acceptable before it can be it should be taken out of a certain situation so these are multiple decisions across the development cycle and at some point, uh, I think the normative implication of thinking about it in this way is that um, lawyers also, but, but lawyers and technologists need to be able to work together at all of those points, N not necessarily always to come up with what we think is absolutely the right answer, but that the answer itself is in some way explicable or comprehensible to those who will suffer the consequences of that particular technology. Right? So, so, so I think my, my, my basic point here is sort of two. One is, I think, theoretically speaking, the emergence of AI-enabled defense systems, which are involved elements of delegation of judgment by, of, of, uh, to machines of decisions that might otherwise have been made by humans, uh, not necessarily decisions to use force, but lots of precursor judgments. Um, this in itself, I think, poses a real challenge, uh, not to the black and white question of legality or illegality, but it poses a re really a deep question to how we articulate and concretize specific legal requirements for the development of those systems and how do we integrate uh, let's let's call it a kind of orientation or an ethos of legality into their development thank you thank you very much nehal um <clears throat> wow uh, one more very rich um intervention uh that uh, with lots of food uh food for thought uh, if I could say, you know, about the two presentations, one I use at Bellum, the other one more about, you know, the, the artificial intelligence and, and, and new types of, of, of weapons. Uh, both of you, you know, I think you highlighted, you know, this, um, we don't talk about only law, we talk a lot about morality, we talk about ethics. Uh, I don't know if I could talk about the limits of law, the interrelationship. Uh, it's kind of going back to basics, as uh, as uh, Eliav said at the beginning, you know, you were talking even about the subjects of state or individuals. And then when it came, you know, to Nahal's presentation, again, this ethos of, of legality, you know, that you concluded your presentation, you know, it shows a, a more nuanced and if I would, if I dare to say a more um, fluid concept of legality that maybe, you know, uh, indicates uh, a bit of more imaginative thinking, you know, to, to move beyond uh, some strict understandings uh, of legality. As you say, we don't found, find it in legal text, but it's a matter, you know, of inter, uh, communication, you know, between lawyers and, 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 and other disciplines. Now, um, uh, having said that, I, I would I would like to give the floor. You know, we have about twenty minutes. You know, for these two presentations, uh, to to participants, please um, raise your hand or or take the floor, uh, or write your. Uh, oh wow, that's I can see now. Is it Luigi? I think Luigi has written. Uh, Luigi, would you would you like to to take the floor? Can you take the floor, or maybe you know summarize your your question? Is that possible? Yes. Okay, Luigi, you have the floor. No? Hello, Luigi, can you hear me? Okay, today something is not uh, uh, working. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know if any haven't Fred, did you did you read the uh, the question and then I can scroll down, you know, and maybe you want to respond. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to respond uh, 
Yeah, thanks, Luigi. Um, yeah, you're absolutely correct that the dilemma actually as phrased by Rodin and other, it applies also to actual aggressions, but in actual aggressions, you know, it's because in, in, maybe not in, you know, crazy hypotheticals, but in real life, they're always, uh, they always involve uh, kinetic force because uh, no aggressor just enters the ter territory and saying, well, if nobody's going to shoot me, I'm not going to, I mean, it happened in World War II, but, but I mean, that's really uh, far-fetched. I agree that the same problem applies to actual aggressions, but I think the situations of wars of recovery, I think it just makes it more radical, as, as Fred also said, because then, you know, we have, you know, a, a long time that has passed without actual killing. So there's really no, or very uh, little uh, chance that um, these killings would be renewed. So, so I think it's a particularly radical case of, of, of an aggression, but I agree that the dilemma as it was originally phrased applies also to, to regular aggression, but, it, but it's like I said, in, in wars of recovery, it's uh, easier to disentangle between territory and life. That's why I think it's more uh, salient there. Um, I don't want to get into Helen Froze. I mean, Helen Froze uh, and other revisionists uh, that, that argue that you know we should, you know, dump the principle of distinction to begin with. I mean, they don't even argue that this should be you know that that should be uh, applied in law uh, in positive law. So, and they say, well, when we think of it, you know, in terms of deep morality. Uh, the guy that designs the weapons and sends people to war uh, is uh, much more uh, culpable than, you know, a foot soldier somewhere. So the principle of distinction doesn't make enough sense. But of course, because of slippery slope and all, uh, all kinds of other consequentialist argument, law should uh, have a bright line of distinction. So I, I don't feel that I have, you know, I can tell you that I, I, I really uh, like uh, Helen Froh's writing, that she's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I tend not to teach that, even when I do teach ethics of war, because I, I just, I, I, I just, it's, it's, it's a bit scary to me. <laughs> so uh, let's uh, uh, end at that. Um, the terms of where do we draw the line between humanizing and politicizing war? Yeah, I mean, that's always a risk when you invoke uh, ethics or any normative argument, um, and I don't think we can really draw a line. But on the other hand. No, I don't, I don't think we can ever do anything which is not based on any normative assumption. Um, so even the, the assumption that we shouldn't involve ethics is a, a normative assumption about what will happen if we will uh, um, involve ethics. So yeah, sorry for taking too long. Thanks, Elia. Nehal, uh, you have a question addressed to you directly. Sorry, let me see if I can see it. Uh... At the Q&A, you can read that, or if you want me to read it. Yeah, if you could, I can't seem to find it. I mean, I can see Okay, it, I so uh, the question is, do some states have currently already autonomous weapon systems, or will these weapon system rather be produced only in the future? So. Um, right, so the, the short answer is that there are, uh, there are highly automated weapon systems, right, which uh, in some sense have been with us for a long time. So they are, um, fire and forget systems where, um, uh, so the a classic example is a kind of loitering munition that um, waits until it registers a certain frequency and then it directs itself to the target. Um, um, and some kinds of missile defense systems are in some sense, for all intents and purposes, autonomous in that once they're switched on, uh, they simply decide for themselves uh, uh, how to uh, or to react to incoming um, uh, incoming ordnance. So, in that sense, we do have something like it, uh, but obviously, it's a very different. Um, I mean, some people prefer to call these automated systems, and there's many um, theaters in which you would simply you could simply rule out using them on the basis that they are their level of discrimination is a little bit too uh, basic, right? So you, you know the, the risk that you could you end up firing these systems where, uh, uh, you know, where there's large civilian population, you simply couldn't use them. So, um, yeah, so from that perspective, uh, uh, we have them, but it not really in the horizon that we're talking about where uh, you're talking, you're thinking of 
um, you know, highly data intensive forms of autonomy. Let's put it that way. These are maybe a better distinction is between very low data intensive forms of autonomy, which we have, uh, um, and which in some sense are quite mechanical, and high data intensive forms of autonomy that make use of what we might call artificial intelligence mechanisms. And Fred has said, is all legal scholarship fire and fish? <laughs> yeah, that could be right. <laughs> Okay, um, any other comment, observation, question? We still have a couple of minutes, you know, before we conclude our first panel. Maybe I, I can give the floor back to, I don't know, Fred, if you would like to add something in the previous question, you know, before. No, uh, that it was addressed to Eliab. Uh, I think it was also addressed uh, to you. I think, How? I think I have a question for Eliab, just. Uh, yes. Uh, so Eliab, I'm not familiar with the, um, this uh, this sort of stylized distinction between um, so, well so long term occupation which is in some sense comparable to bloodness uh, bloodless occupation I just wonder if you explain that a bit more so is the kind of case for that the example of that something like uh, Nagorno Karabakh or um, uh, I mean it's just you know uh, I guess my puzzle is to what extent do the normative considerations hold. Um, if there is in some sense always con the contestation of the occupation and people are always resisting it, fighting on its behalf, or alternatively, the occupier is doing all sorts of things that um, are about damaging the, the life of the population or destroying that political society. I mean, that's no longer an international armed conflict, but it, it, does that, do the considerations that you're talking about have any application to it? Well, you know, I, I don't want to kind of for I haven't looked into the case studies uh, deep enough to kind of think, well, can we really say that Nagorno-Karabakh is, is this way or the Golan Heights is that way? Um, I think, yeah, maybe you're right, you know, that I shouldn't phrase this as a real life uh, example because uh, it, might, it might be that it's just as hypothetical as as bloodless aggression. So, so, so it might be not precise to, uh, to phrase it that way if I don't have a case study which I can really commit to uh, right now. But I do think it's a, I think it's a more possible situation than bloodless invasion. It's more easy to envision something like this happening and, and to make a remotely plausible claim that some situations um, might, you know, uh, be considered uh, such situation, especially when you have, you know, and, and again, without prejudging the facts, when we, you have a situation like Crimea, and I know there are rights violations there, but let's assume that most of the population wants to be part of Russia. And again, it's a big if, let's assume, okay? Um, and in such situations, really, I think it kind of exposes the dilemma um, of, of, of resort to force to, to recover the, the territory. Um, so, it, yeah, so I would leave it at that. Okay, uh, any other comment or uh, question? Then maybe I can ask back, you know, uh, if it's okay to Luigi's thing about the humanization, you know, and uh, I, I, we all know that it's a big deal, you know, we were talking, I mean, we talk about the humanization of international law, then we went into the humanization of IHL. <laughs> Now, as uh, Eliav has written as well, you know, we talk about the humanization of ad bellum, you know, and I'm not talking about humanitarian intervention, but I'm talking the general comment 36, you know, making an aggressive war, arbitrary loss of life in an aggressive war also uh, under human rights law. And, and uh, Luigi's question was about, you know, the, the, the risk and dangers. It, it feels also that we go back to basic. And then, you know, I, I was impressed. Uh, Eliab, you know, when you went back to the right to life, you know, when, when you used uh, the, the, the human rights thing. So, so I still wonder, you know, um, what does that mean? And this is a very strong, of course, we know Andrew Clapham has a very strong position about that, you know, the humanization thing. And this was very much actually in his latest book, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, uh, of uh, basically since we outlawed war, everything else, you know, uh, has to be out of the picture, uh, but 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 I wonder what are your thoughts, any of your thoughts about that? I know it's a very big topic, but maybe we can conclude with a couple of thoughts from all of you if you want. Yeah, I, I I don't understand 
the idea of General Common 36 as saying that uh, killings pursuant to an act of aggression or ipso facto violations of the right to life, that doesn't mean that it makes, you know, IHL or everything redundant. It simply makes kind of a normative split. So soldiers that kill other soldiers and an aggression would still be compliant with IHL. They would still not be committing a war crime. They would still enjoy combatant immunity. On the other hand, the people on the receiving end might have a valid claim against the state from human rights. So it's kind of a split between combatant immunity, which is preserved by IHL and human rights law, which attaches to the state qua state. So, so, I, so I, I don't think it, uh, many people think that, well, it throws up, uh, you know, combatant uh, immunity and uh, equality of belligerence out of the picture. No, it just adds another level of illegality to an already existing illegality under the use ad bellum. And I think it might have a lot of, you know, very practical implications. For instance, uh, if you look at the ruling for preliminary measures uh, from the European Court of Human Rights about Ukraine and Russia. So the court uh, calls on Russia to cease attacks against civilians. If you understand, you know, aggression as a human rights issue, even against combatants, so you should add that to the equation, right? So why do the, the I mean, why, why is the preliminary uh, uh, injunction, whatever the term is, is against the only killing of civilians if soldiers also possess a right to life, right? So it opens up a lot of, uh, you know, possible venues for discussing, of, uh, for legal discussion, even if we don't, you know, throw out the window the whole idea of uh, legal belligerent equality under IHL. Thanks. Uh, anyone else has thoughts about that or something uh, that you would like to comment? Nehal, uh, if I can say that before we, we, we complete, I, I remember that I was in one of these meetings round tables and at some sites the humorized language, you know, discourse came back to the table, especially with autonomous weapons, with artificial intelligence. And some, some people, they even suggested about the human right, a, a right to, to human intervention you know, that we need a new human right, you know, and that will be. And I was a little bit, I was very much puzzled about from this suggestion, you know, I thought, I, th I found it very uh, problematic given the fact that we always go back to human rights, you know, and we think that the answer to everything is a human rights thing. So um, I know, you know, I, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if you, if you have any thoughts about that or no, no more, no pressure on you. Thanks, Ralph. Uh, thanks. No, that's interesting. I suppose, that, again, I think the, the discussion about um, the right to human intervention or, you know, uh, um, uh, meaningful human control, right, in a way, uh, so first of all, it's not really clear what's the, what's the legal scaffolding that makes meaningful human control significant. It seems to be much more of a... Um, of a kind of intuition or a moral or ethical position, which we then could try to find some foundation for in different human rights norms. Um, but the, I suppose for me, the again, this is really just re reflecting on my own experience with this um, in the last sort of year or two. Uh, it, in order to create something called meaningful human control, uh, you're, you, it's, a, it's somewhat misleading or somewhat of a distraction to think about a sort of singular point in time that says, okay, once you're out in the field using it, there's got to be a moment of meaningful human control. In fact, chances are the, the nature of human control and its meaningfulness by that moment is already completely constrained by a whole set of operating procedures, uh, by the data that, that, and the ways of, of uh, analyzing and the models of data that are being of, of analyzing data that are all built into this system of systems that's out there in the field. So, meaningful human control it, chances are at that moment uh, it is um, potentially quite narrow. And speaking of it sort of formalistically as something that you have a legal right to at that moment, again, could be um, a mistake. It could be, you know, we could debate the the legal foundations of that of that claim. But that could be something of a distraction as to what we're trying to achieve. You know, what we're trying to achieve, as I, as I suggested, seems to me anyway, 
is a is a um, a framework of iterability of explainability of making uh, the parameters of decision making meaningful at a given moment. Uh, in order to to do that, we actually need to begin our processes much earlier, right, so that we can explain how it is that the operator at that moment had these constrained set of choices and whether they were reasonable in acting on those choices at that moment. But confining ourselves to the reasonableness of the human control at that moment is seems to me inadequate, right? Because it, first of all, it could set the humans up as scapegoats, but secondly, it creates the perception or the appearance of a framework of explainability and accountability that's actually really not sufficient, I think. Okay, thank you very much all. Unless there is, I don't think we have any other question and comment. I think uh, I want to thank uh, very much uh, both our speakers for this extremely uh, sophisticated and refined uh, interventions, both of you on user bellum and user bellum, and not only about law and morality, about the limits, the prospects, uh, about where we go, uh, problematizing our audience. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you to all the participants for, for attending, for uh, submitting questions. We will have a short break and uh, we will come back in 10, 15 minutes, you know, with the second session where Fred, Christian, and Devika uh, will join us. And again, you know, there will be again a panel on, on uh, it's not only, it's a, it's a combination of normativity, history, uh, theory, another panel on uh, IHL, on user bellum, and of course, on abusive internationalists. So on that note, thank you very much, Nahal. Thank you very much, Elia. Thank you all. I know you are very busy and you have to run. Uh, to your other uh, duties. It was great seeing you and hopefully next time we'll be all in person. I'll in try to log in from the train. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you all. We will be back in 10 uh, minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Hi, Christian. Hello, Fred. How are you? Just trying to get the... Uh, can you hear me now? I, yeah, I can definitely hear you. No okay, problem. It's good to see you. So good what's the background? You. Good to see you. Is that a, a real background? Sort of, or no, is no. it fake? It's all, it's all fake. It's a Potemkin background. It's, uh, no, it is, yeah. it is actually, I think, uh, it, it's, it's McGill University, uh, a part of the library somewhere. Um, yeah, they provide us with these uh, backgrounds, which, you know, turned out to be quite useful uh, during the pandemic to sort of give the illusion of normality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And speaking of the big issues, are you are you post pandemic now? I mean, I, I remember when we once met, you were traveling with family through the Near East. And I still think that's one of the coolest. I mean, yeah. the, the, the Nile and it was everything. So I, I think this was the, sort of this Armenian event in, in Beirut. Yes. Or so. Are you, yes. are you are you back to that no i uh, you know it, it's taken a hit for sure and you know i find myself uh, sometimes wondering whether i didn't end up trapped on the wrong side of the atlantic given that you know to this day still most of my activities are in europe but you know going has just become exponentially more complicated and expensive so I still do it, but uh, but not with family as 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 I used to. Obviously, family is now getting older and a bit harder to sort of travel with. Right back in the days, it was uh, just a toddler was uh, was manageable. But yeah, so uh, I'm not sure. You know, so I'm thinking sometimes I should uh, I should move back before I'm too old. But it's become uh, yeah, no flying flying is. Uh, like if for every gig you need to cross the Atlantic, it, it's complicated. I mean, I, I obviously have things in the US and Canada, but not really. I mean, international, it's fascinating how international remains quite 
Eurocentered as we as we know. Well, well, I think in Europe it remains Eurocentric. Um, yeah, 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 not, yeah. Not sure. I think elsewhere it, it remains elsewhere centered. Yeah. Anyway. No, yeah. I think mean, that's true. Um, anyway, but... <laughs> Maria, I think you want. Are you warning us that everybody else is listening in before we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, but, it, but it's okay. <laughs> then we are going to. No, you didn't say anything. Uh, I don't sure. Know. We exchange. Uh, okay. Oh, sure, well. sure. It's all recording as well. <laughs> All recorded well, well, well. Well, everything is recorded, even when we don't know at the end of the day, right? So, yeah, fair enough. Yep, exactly. All right. The Vika so, will join us. Is at Kent, somewhere outside in the countryside. So she told me, hopefully, her internet is working. You know, so hopefully everything will be fine. Uh, yes, sorry, but Fred. Are we starting? No. We don't. But uh, everybody um, could hear us. <laughs> what, so, but but uh, Maria, what's the um, whom do you want to go first? Uh, you can go. I mean, definitely, the vicar will be the last one. You know, I know that for sure. Uh, so uh, you can go. Uh, you, you decide how you go. I'm going to introduce briefly. You know, and then the logic was you can talk up to twenty minutes, and then you say it's very relaxed and uh, sure. Yeah, you get you can say share powerpoints if you have. I mean, that okay, was... I'll, I'll be without PowerPoint. Okay. Um, yeah. And I don't know, just judging from, I mean, yeah. just, why don't you just pick, Maria? I think we'll, we'll follow orders. I mean, oh, I'll, uh, I'll follow orders. Uh, uh, telling the Greek that you follow orders is a very difficult thing. Okay, I cannot exercise any you of only them. Need, you only need to give them, Maria. So yeah. Yeah. you don't need to follow them. No, but you see, I cannot exercise any kind of authority. That's the problem. But let's go uh -huh. with a, with, a, with, a, with a program, you know, like. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the program? What was I the think order? Christian was first. Right. <laughs> uh, and then okay. we have Fred and then Devika will join us afterwards. And guys, yeah. thank you so much. I know it was very difficult to do it. OK. Oh, no. We made it, but, but I'm very happy because, you know, I, I just wanted this type of thing that everybody wants to say whatever he, he wants to say, you know. Sure. Choose sure, a sure. thing that you work and you think, okay, I want to highlight and talk about yeah. that. Yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, that's the idea. So we start in, uh, Edwin said, by the way, I can say that although it's recorded everywhere, you know, that traveling within, uh, outside from UK now to continental Europe, it's not easy. Okay, especially the last days with a shortage of personnel in all British airports and, and, and everything. So, yeah. And Brexit hasn't started uh, uh, to the big extent, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a big ocean that's now separating you from uh, the rest of the continent. Yeah, you know, I was in Milan last week for two days. There was this conference on the concept of obligation. And uh, we, we landed in Milan and then there were these Italian um, officers and they were shouting Europeans and uh, what did they say? Uh, Italians and Europeans that side, you know, passport control, Brits this side. It was the first time that I had it like that, you know, like yeah. Europeans that side. Wow, you know, the Italians yeah. were, you know, merciless. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, so the idea is to go ahead with the Agile Unbound thing afterwards, is that? Yeah. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will, yeah. Right. I wanted, although I see there are so many things, you saw this one on Ukraine in the national order, I think. Oh yeah, but we're not, No. we're not Ukraine focused. No, 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 I thought it was, it's, we have to go beyond, everybody's doing Oh yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Everybody is doing Ukraine. I we had many roundtables on Ukraine here as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, speaking of occupation and everything, and I was also thinking, you know, what happens with annexation? You know, if the, if the Ukrainians will say they agree. If if all scholarship, what say? If the Ukrainians agree to give up part of the. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. Uh... At the moment, it seems more likely that others agree for you. Yeah, 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 the French are particular <laughs> and the Italians, I think, now. Never leave out the Germans when it comes to sort of making wrong decisions. But, uh, um, but anyway, but that's for a separate talk. Yeah, I'm coming in a second, guys. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, I can see Alessandra. Okay, Alessandra Gianelli from uh, Sapienza, Professor Gianelli says, the agreement is invalid, but I'm just a nasty Italian. No, Alessandra, you're a wonderful Italian. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, yeah, it becomes an issue. It's, it's on the table. Yeah, I mean, the Ukrainians will do, you know, what they do, and that's not for us to second guess. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in defense of uh, international norms, but, uh, but it's something different to their being pressured to do something that's not in, in their interest. Okay, so we have uh, kind of three, four minutes and then we start. And hopefully this recording thing will be cut. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I want to believe. <laughs> That's a classic, right? I mean, I have had uh, uh, Zoom classes followed by uh, questions, you know, with students who linger and then forgotten to uh, stop recording. And then you, you yeah. have to edit because it can yeah. go into, in all kinds of, you know, directions and the students haven't agreed for their, uh, you know, bilateral discussions with us to, to yeah. then uh, yeah. be uploaded for posterity. So yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Um, Okay, would you like to start maybe, you know, uh, David yeah. join us, I think, very shortly, you know, so, uh, so maybe we can start and then people will rejoin, you know, <laughs> at three o'clock. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone, after you have heard all our discussion about Brexit and uh, traveling uh, outside Europe and inside Europe and to what extent international law remains Eurocentric or not. So uh, now officially, I'm very happy to, um, to start the second session uh, with two, I know it's a cliche, but it's a fact, with two uh, very well-known, I would say, leading scholars of international law, Professor Christian Tams and uh, Professor Frederick McGray. I'm very happy you are with me. You accepted my invitation. It was a role caster for quite a few months. Uh, I think Eliab, I'd mute you. Uh, it was a roller coaster for quite some month, you know, to, to manage to run this in bed, but I'm very happy we are here. And we will continue with the same uh, module, with the same understanding, you know, um, both of them, each of them will address, and then Devika, Professor Devika Hopper will join us in a while. Uh, they will address, uh, they will talk about an issue that they decided to choose. They want to shed more light on this issue uh, within the broader context of international law and, and war, as you have understood until now, uh, we combine uh, normativity with theory and history as well. And I'm very happy to give the floor first to Professor Christian Tams from the University of Glasgow, and not only, uh, with an extensive um, uh, scholarship in many, many uh, issues of international law and dispute settlements and arbitration and every other aspect of international law. Uh, so Christian will continue talking about self-defense from a different perspective. Uh, so Christian, thank you very much for accepting my invitation and you have the floor, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you everybody for listening in, um, not just on the chat in between sessions, but perhaps even staying on for the chat during the sessions, in this case, the second session. It's great to be uh, with you, Maria, so all delighted to be, have been invited and to participate in this session on, I don't know, not commem commemorating, but acknowledging the 60 years anniversary of King's College's Department of War Studies and doing so in a, in a fitting way, namely a discussion on themes related to war and conflict. Now, my, my idea is, uh, or my idea has been to respond to that invitation by picking something that is uh, slightly different from the papers you've heard in the first session, uh, slightly less focused on immediately relevant issues, certainly less developed than some of the papers you've heard before the break, so that's an advance apology, um, but to reflect more broadly on developments over the course of the 60 years in the Jus Contra Bellum, coinciding 
with the existence of the Department of War Studies. So it is perhaps, I think I'm taking up your point about back to basics, Maria, that's for sure. Um, it's gonna be relatively broad brush. It's gonna be, if you want to put it positively, big picture stuff. If you want to put it cautiously, don't expect detail uh, and don't expect sort of finely developed, sophisticated argument. It's a discussion that I propose to initiate about um, major shifts in the way we argue about legitimate uses of force in international law, and in particular about how we use that dominant exception that permits uh, the lawful use of force, at least unilaterally, self-defense. I've entitled this versatile self-defense, uh, the idea that self-defense serves very many purposes, um, is perhaps much broader than domestic lawyers trained to work with self-defense, at least it's claimed to be much broader than many domestic lawyers used to the self-defense notion from other fields of law uh, would expect. Um, I will briefly speak about that, but then have spent more time discussing about the flip side of that, namely what it is that over the last 60 years has been brushed aside as plausible other claims to use force, not in self-defense, but still unilaterally. So that's the big picture topic that I want to reflect on. And you note from the way I'm setting this up that there's no aim at fine development. It is purposefully and unashamedly and unabashedly um, big picture, broad brush, scratching the surface. But here we go. Now, to start this, let me go back to what I, I'm looking at, sort of the Department of War Studies, King's College, always perceived to be the mission statement, Michael Howard's statement from 1962, why was a, a department like this needed? It was needed to respond to the major question of the day, as perceived by him in the early 1960s, under what circumstances there could be uh, war and force could be used legitimately, which was the only way it should be used, and that was the lasting defining question for um, ensuring a lasting and stable peace. Now, legitimacy is broader than lawfulness, and the Department of War Studies is famous for not being focused on one discipline in assessing war. Um, but lawfulness is, of course, part of the legitimacy debate. You see it in all attempts to come up with legitimate uses of force that lawfulness, adherence to normative prescriptions that developed in international law, is a key part, if not the only part, uh, of that analysis. Um, now, uh, the practice since 1945, uh, the debate about lawful uses of force is shaped primarily, not exclusively, by uh, a debate about the scope of exceptions that exceptionally permit the use of force. And that is for a simple reason that International law since 1945 has come to operate with a blanket prohibition. We can discuss about exceptions, well, not exceptions, we kind of can discuss about limitations on the fringes of that prohibition. Does it cover every minimal use of force? Is there a threshold implicit in it? Those are usefully uh, had discussions. Uh, we can also rehearse debates from the early days whether the intention or the goal of using force would matter and only certain motivations and certain goals and aims pursued would, um, would trigger the prima facie breach of international law. But I think those are the lesser discussions. I mean, relevant, but compared to the discussions about the scope of exceptions, they are the lesser ones because international law relatively, I mean, dramatically, surprisingly, and quickly settled on the idea that there could be a blanket breach, at least prima facie, a blanket prohibition that would cover things that had dominated international relations for thousands of years. And everything would be covered by one prohibition hardly accentuated, only perhaps nuanced through, uh, if you want, heightened levels of labels such as aggression and otherwise, but all caught by a blanket general prohibition on the use of force, military force, that we uh, grant all the attributes that international lawyers can afford to use to sort of use Kogan's peremptory ground norm, perhaps a crime, et cetera, et cetera. So now happy to pursue all this in the discussions, but I think just marking this for now to say that I think one of the dramatic developments, perhaps even preceding the establishment of the War Studies Department, is how quickly that was uh, accepted as a matter of normative principle. And if and once that had been accepted, it's clear that the onus is always on states using force to prove that an exception applies. 
And as that exception applies, I think at least today's perspective is if we're being textualist and if we're being treaty oriented and if we acknowledge the dominance of the charter and shaping the regime, we see a very clear distinction between one um, obviously acknowledged exception, self-defense, um, which is ill-defined, which is not open-ended, uh, which comes with perhaps traditional meanings and understandings, but they are not necessarily reflected in the text, but we have a blurring of sources debates where we have certainly no clarity of textual meaning um, and where we have relatively, I mean, an urgent need to rely on, um, on flanking conditions to rein in what self-defense is. We also have the one textually acknowledged exception, which comes with extremely positive connotations. Who would deny the right to be using force in self-defense? That is as good as it gets if we're in a legitimately discourse, self-defense is the best argument you can bring. You may be abusing it, but self-defense as a notion is wonderful. It's much better than necessity or something that comes with limitations. So I would say, at least from today's perspective, we re see relatively clearly that in the debate about exceptions, we can distinguish between the one universally acknowledged and accepted notion of permitting unilateral force, namely self-defense, and the others, which may be candidates, but which come with a lot of baggage and where the development of the argument is an uphill struggle because uh, there's so much, um, I mean, it's so difficult to justify that in a system that is purposefully complete, where you have one textually accepted uh, exception, there should be room for others, where you have all the labels that will sort of come against you, sort of use Kogan's uh, primacy of peace, et cetera, et cetera, scourge of war. Um, so it's, it's, it's a distinction in the way we argue about the exceptions. That's a, you might say a very broad, uh, opening gambit, but it sort of sets me up for the point I want to make and perhaps hint at developing in the remainder of the, the remaining 10 minutes, perhaps. Um, I think there are two things that we can observe. The first I'll observe for today's perspective, 2022. Uh, I think perhaps as a result of this normative setting, or perhaps just by coincidence, we see that self-defense claims abound, um, and in a range of settings. Self-defense dominates the discourse. It seems quite broad and covers a range of, of settings that some of us might intuitively link to self-defense. And uh, in other instances, it may be more difficult to, to make an intuitive link. Now, I won't be comprehensive, but we have perhaps the sort of the Ukraine type setting. The state is attacked, responds in kind, forcibly. Why should this not be self-defense? I think there would have been hardly any discussion around that. Uh, at any point that disqualifies as self-defense. But we've got, of course, lots of other things where self-defense is invoked, even if we go by formal invocations and, as in letters to the Security Council under Article 51. Eliev has told us about one, which is by no means the furthest uh, afield from the intuitive natural meaning, if you want. Um, self-defense temporarily removed to recover territory, conquered, occupied, or annexed uh, through the illegal use of force. Um, various intervening measures may have taken place to preclude the legitimacy of that self-defense or the, the self-defense claim in those settings. Clearly once removed, at least one removed from the Ukraine situation, but by no means the furthest uh, afield. We've got debates about self-defense being invoked, and I think this is probably now the majority of instances uh, in cases where the attack doesn't originate from another state, but from a non-state group. Terrorist is the obvious example, but by no means the only one. Self-defense against terrorists is a massive debate that has, I don't know, shaped 20 years of discourse in international law. We don't need to rehearse that. Um, we can agree to disagree whether that's self-defense or not. It's certainly invoked as such in dozens and hundreds of cases. And as I said, there's probably a lot more practice invoking self-defense against non-state actors than there is against state actors. Um, we have self-defense being invoked to hunt down criminals terrorists or others. Um, when the UK wanted justification to kill its nationals uh, uh, a few, 10 years ago, what was the basis, at least for the use contra bellum, it was self-defense because none other was available. When President Bush, the elder at some point, um, was the subject of an attempted uh, assassination and the US felt the need to retaliate um, on Baghdad, this was explained ostensibly as self-defense. When, uh, when nationals are rescued in dire circumstances, there is perhaps an element of, a, of another uh, justification, 
but often self-defense is mentioned. Um, when states respond on the spot in skirmishes, notwithstanding the difficulty of the armed attack threshold, sometimes self-defense is mentioned. Um, so it's an extremely broad range, and this is by no means exhaustive, but extremely broad range of settings um, and factual patterns in which self-defense is alleged. It's very popular as a defense. Now, none of this is to say that the invocation is proper and valid. Um, some would say, if you read, say, Olivier Cortin or Mary Ellen O'Connell, then five of my six examples would not qualify because self-defense may be invoked, but invalidly so, and the limits would have been uh, transgressed or it was, uh, it was fabricated. And that's, that's a plausible normative argument, even though on, on individual instances I might disagree. Um, the difficulty is that we have relatively little authoritative decision-making on this. It's not that self-defense claims are routinely adjudicated upon, whether in a court setting or in any other authoritative setting. We have a reporting mechanism. We have occasional comments on, on self-invocations. We have some debate. And, uh, and we have occasional judgments by institutions or statements by uh, the UN. Uh, they don't seem to settle the debate. This could be cynically explained uh, that perhaps certain states continue to rely on self-defense and don't like what they hear from the ICJ or from the General Assembly and then simply refuse to give in. Uh, I think there's a plausible argument that there is clarity uh, in, in normative statements by the ICJ or an element of clarity in normative statements by the ICJ and the General Assembly or the group of 77. And we should simply take that into account. Um, others could say that this is, uh, this is all beyond the level of concrete instances and the disputes remain. Um, so maybe for now, I just, um, I just leave it at this. There's, there's a broad range of invocate, invoking self-defense. It is versatile in the terms I chose for this short intervention. Now, what do we do with this? I think there's an obvious perspective, and I briefly go through this, that there has been normative drift. I think those are sort of the often quoted comment by Daniel Bethlehem, who was probably happy with some of the normative drift, or, but um, at least sort of uh, was not necessarily in the Olivier Cotten or Mary Ellen O'Connell camp sort of ruling all those instances out. But um, there's normative drift that self-defense is invoked in ever broader settings and ever more diverse settings. Um, that's one angle. You could also take uh, the opposite angle and say there's a real demand for some justification uh, and, uh, and for some, and, and justification just meets that demand. It is a readily available, um, not very concretized uh, exception that permits uh, self-defense and, and hence is regularly invoked. I'm happy to discuss which one of those angles is right. But I wanted to, in the remaining five, six minutes, perhaps speak about something else, namely, what is the flip side of this? If self-defense is invoked more broadly, and if there is perhaps normative drift, um, then, uh, then what is missing? Or is that really sort of, has that really changed? And to tell you why I think it has, let me take you back 60 years in a, in a time travel to the days when the Department of War Studies was set up. Uh, and let's just, I mean, I'm not sort of proposing to you to sort of do any sort of serious analysis of the scholarship at the time or the issues at the time, but let's do a, a superficial assessment of the debates at the time. And I think the basic point I wanna make is 60 years ago, when the Department of War Studies was set up, there was a much, there was a diversity of invocations of justification for use of force but they were far less focused on self-defense. Self-defense at the time, of course, even though the text of the charter was the same, was relevant and was the most relevant of the various instances, but on the fringes and perhaps not just on the fringes of the debate, you had plausible alternative uh, justifications for using unilateral force. Um, now, what, so, so I think perhaps rather than seeing normative drift in self-defense, or in addition to seeing normative drift in self-defense, we can also observe one level removed and one level more abstract, um, normative stratification uh, in the focus, exclusive focus nowadays on self-defense, where 60 years ago, we had a more diverse set of issues that were debated uh, in, in the use contra bellum. To 
just give you an example of what I mean by this, because you might say it's a trite point, but I think it's quite significant to go back 60 years in time and to look at the debate. You had plausible discussions about a range of other uh, justifications. Um, 1962, I think it's sort of 1962, 63, the UK invoked famously uh, a doctrine of forcible reprisals, um, justifying some reactions in, I think, in the Yemen, strikes against the Yemen, it was famously rebuked by the Security Council uh, in 1963, 1964, in, in cases that are constantly cited by everyone as evidence for the prohibition on armed reprisals under contemporary international law. Um, you had a, a whole range of questions going to the use of force in colonial and decolonial settings um, outside the scope of self-defense. Uh, you had uh, in the 1960s, the resurgence of the debate about uh, uses of force in a very specific, discrete, you might say, setting, um, a hot pursuit uh, on, on the seas, resulting just a few years after the, uh, the setting up of the Department of War Studies and the publication of the major work still to this day on hot pursuit by Pulanzas in the mid 1960s. You had, from my own sort of German upbringings and sort of in, in legal education, you had in 1963 an article published by a famous German international lawyer. Um, dam on the shooting down of aircraft prompted by some recent incident at the time and self-defense wasn't mentioned. Why could you shoot down aircraft uh, transgressing into your airspace? Not because of any ambitious construction or liberal construction of the armed attack requirement. You could do it as a defense of your air sovereignty and that was relied on and put forward plausibly as a, as a separate self-standing title uh, for, for using limited ranges of force defensively. Uh, that's before we get to nationals and, and their rescuing uh, abroad. And that's before we get to what is perhaps in some ways the most ingenuous and bizarre uh, titles, perceived titles for using force outside self-defense. The idea that you would be able to extend the hot pursuit argument from the seas to the land. It could swap onto the land and could be used hot pursuit, something like hot pursuit to pursue armed bands on, uh, on the territory of another state, something that had happened frequently that's covered in the Brownlee and Bauer debates of the 50s and 60s, but that in the 60s, late 60s and 70s would be put forward as a doctrine of hot pursuit on land by South Australia, by Portugal, who, who, who relied on that limited, very curious uh, ground for using counterforce to justify incursions into, from South Africa into frontline states, from Portuguese territory into neighboring states in pursuit of armed bands waging anti-colonial, decolonial struggles. Now, all this, I would say, and I'm sure there's much more, but all this to me sounds like echoes if we compare to today's debate from a very, very distant past. Um, today, none of these claims would be, I mean, hot pursuit still exists, but some of the other claims um, are simply not made. They're not plausible. Um, hot pursuit on land was put forward, but I mean, the minute, the minute something was put forward by South Africa in the 70s and 80s, you probably could bet on it that it would not really sort of go down well with the international community. So this has been given up. Um, armed defensive force to protect your airspace? I don't know. Is that really it? Armed reprisals? You might say that what happens today looks like that, but can you make a plausible argument that would withstand scrutiny in, in legal debates nowadays? Probably not. Uh, at least... Uh, it's not really it's not really going very far so it seems to me and this is very very simplified of course but that we have seen in parallel to the normative drift and self-defense we've seen a normative stratification and in the debate that is not fringy but let's say plausible self-defense is now used for all sorts of instances of of, uh, of uh, counterforce as almost the last exception standing so i think we have these two trends um on the one hand self-defense being blurry and ever more blurry. On the other hand, uh, a far more orderly, you could say, debate about exceptions to force because it, everything is channeled through self-defense. That's the basic point I want to put to you and which I'm happy to discuss. I don't want to preempt the discussion, but maybe just initiate it with or put it on, on some track with two thoughts. I think there's far too little discussion about the correlation um, uh, between uh, the possible correlation between those two. It may be, I mean, one cynical realist claim that you could make is that there's a demand for using force, whatever the law says, in certain settings, and that demand will find its, its legal avenues and legal, uh, legal um, instantiations and arguments. 
And the more we make it difficult to rely on, or the more the discourse agrees on self-defense being the one and only defense, uh, the more that one and only defense now has to then used to cater to all sorts of different needs, whether they plausibly and intuitively relate to notions of self-defense or not. So if you want the shrinking of the normative arsenal of arguments that could be made would causally lead to a blurry notion of self-defense. Uh, so in some ways we're paying the price for a more orderly macro level by having to deal with a very disorderly micro argument on self-defense. That's one angle and I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts on this. The other angle is about the stakes in this. Uh, I think I'm, I'm comfortable with um, the sort of um, beware of admitting uh, extra grounds of sort of other than self-defense. It's very difficult, I think, plausibly to argue that there should be unwritten exception in the use contra bellum. Um, but I do think the one price we're paying is that by channeling everything through self-defense, a differently, I mean, an exception that is so different, difficult to police and that is so positively connotated, I think the risk is that we're uh, making it more difficult to hedge in the scope of the force that is being used. And sometimes, and this is sort of maybe a devil's advocate thought, I sometimes wish that we could have conducted the whole debate about self-defense against terrorists and non-state actors through the prism of hot pursuit. Um, of course, unthinkable and you might say purely hypothetical because it, it's been roundly and, and resolutely and robustly rebuffed. But just imagine, um, it was always put forward as a narrow defense. It was always put forward as temporarily limited. It was almost, uh, it, was, it was put forward as something that was um, geographically limited on the spot. I think, I mean, for somebody who's been willing to engage with an argument that self-defense could be used to uh, respond to terrorist threat, uh, threats, I've been preoccupied with the limitless nature of the counterforce that you permit. I think other grounds that were more narrowly tailored to particular circumstances would have made it a lot more difficult, um, a lot more easy, a lot easier to rein in uh, the scope of force or normatively to come up with arguments that constrain the force that is being used. Now that's a hypothetical because I'm not suggesting that we should rehash both debates about hot pursuit on land. It's just an illustration that I think um, the choice of self-defense as the one, the one vehicle or the one instrument or the one tool through which we channel all our debates about permissible unilateral counterforce comes at a price. And I think in the, price, in the sense of self-defense, it, it is a sort of, we're, we're waging a debate on the terrain of a, of, a, of a defense that is difficult to police and difficult to, to limit uh, uh, because it is so positively connotated. I leave it at that, looking forward to our discussion on this uh, and curious, but above all curious to hear what Fred and the Vika have to present in their, in their talks. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Christian. That was, again, a, a really an excellent presentation, very, very um, triggering lots of thinking. And thank you very much for engaging so much, you know, with the, with the War Studies Department, and uh, which is an interdisciplinary department. So when you mentioned also the realist approach, you know, I thought, okay, it's not only about law. Uh, I was trying to find a kind of analogy, you know, about this correlation you said, you know, that we channel everything through self-defense, you know, and it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's really fascinating. I will think a little bit more about that, but I think this is a very uh, interesting point to, for further discussion. Now, on that note, thank you very much. I would like to give the, the floor to Frederick. McGrath, Professor McGrath from McGill University. Uh, Fred will talk about um, uh, another provocative uh, topic. Oh. Not, I won't call it provocative, but I would say intriguing topic he's working on, on uh, prisoners of war, race, and other issues. And Fred, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Maria. Very grateful for the, uh, for the opportunity um, and glad to present today something that is uh, still fairly early in the making. I'll be very honest with you, my uh, delivery won't be quite as uh, authoritative as uh, Christian's because I'm still trying to work uh, the argument uh, out as I go. Uh, but I think there's something there. So it's, uh, it's maybe a provocative title. It's certainly a long title, which hints at my uh, you know, the fact that I'm trying to do several things with this, uh, with this project. So 
Let me maybe uh, backtrack a little and suggest that one of the uh, starting points is kind of frustration, lingering frustration with how we conceive of a relationship between international humanitarian law and uh, human rights, uh, a sort of a particularly, you know, doctrinal international lawyers, uh, um, uh, you know, reducing this to sort of very functionalist uh, question and maybe not doing justice to the complex ways in which the two have interacted uh, historically and continue to uh, interact. So, uh, you know, and in order to transcend that uh, narrow uh, doctrinal approach, I think we need to, uh, you know, further return to uh, history and, uh, you know, look beyond sort of broad abstract debates about how norms relate to each other uh, and look in, in a little more detail uh, at uh, practices in, in and, and during warfare uh, that give us clues about uh, how the two are sort of articulated and, and uh, you know, have uh, interact with each other. So uh, I think I saw earlier that Boyd was amongst the audience. So I take uh, one of my cues from his uh, earlier Agil article uh, in which I think very interestingly, he uncovered the extent to which human rights uh, were closer to the heart of contemporary international humanitarian law than is typically understood. Uh, and I, I take my cue from that, and I, I don't, I, I agree with that uh, intuition. But what I want to uh, suggest is that uh, paradoxically and counterintuitively, uh, international humanitarian law itself was much more crucial to the rise of uh, human rights uh, than is typically assumed. So, and that's a bit counterintuitive because I think we think of international humanitarian law as a kind of parent pauvre of that relationship and always lagging behind. And I want to suggest that at least in some very specific contexts, international humanitarian law uh, was a place of uh, early exploration of core human rights norms. Uh, and particularly what I want to emphasize uh, today is the role of uh, international humanitarian law in struggling with uh, and producing meaning around uh, the prohibition of uh, racial discrimination. Um, and I want to do so by a sort of uh, a close examination of something that, uh, you know, happens behind the uh, front lines and but is really crucial, which is uh, prisoners of war and, and particularly prisoners of pr prisoner of war camps. I'm very intrigued by the camp uh, as a place where uh, soldiers of various national and uh, ethnic and religious and racial origins are kind of thrust together uh, and where questions arise for detaining powers for commanders, uh, very concrete questions about uh, how you know, the extent to which these troops should be mixed or the extent to which certain principles might recommend uh, against mixing them, and, and uh, as I'll uh, try to show, this, this has been uh, a, a, a question that has been present throughout the 20th century uh, as war and participation in warfare became uh, more ethnically and uh, racially uh, diversified. So, um, so, you know, this also goes against the I, th I think, by the way, Theodore Meron's idea of the human humanization of international humanitarian law, right? So the idea that at best international humanitarian law was sort of late in its development, absorb norms from human rights. I think, you know, in some ways, prisoner of war camps raised early on, maybe a, a, a couple of decades early questions that uh, could not possibly be addressed uh, uh, domestically. And so uh, we're kind of interesting prisms uh, to explore questions about uh, uh, racial uh, equality in particular. So there's a whole um, history to this. And, and the paper as I'm uh, conceiving it right now is, is fairly chronological. Uh, I, I, some early developments in the civil war uh, when um, the use by the Union of African American troops led to a kind of breakdown of a parole and prisoner exchange process, uh, the Union insisted that all prisoners, whether they were whether they were uh, black or white, should be treated the same for exchange purposes, and the Confederacy 
uh, uh, predictably insisted that actually uh, blacks, you know, should be treated as runaway slaves and returned to their uh, owners. Uh, so this this was not, you know, uh, uh, conclusive, but but clearly. Uh, you know, the Union wanted to tr all its soldiers to be treated the same for the purposes of international humanitarian law, um, whereas the Confederacy uh, wanted to uh, you know, maintain a stark division between Blacks and, and Whites. So there's a whole debate of, uh, by historians, who I won't get into here, on how uh, whether Black Union prisoners of war were treated worse than uh, white prisoners of war. Uh, and the general answer is yes, somewhat, although maybe not as badly as uh, one might expect. And I think this, uh, as, as you'll see, this will lead me to suggest that international humanitarian law uh, paradoxically provided uh, higher protections than uh, obviously a sort of domestic law, right? Uh, um, uh, the use which is a four uh, in the at least, you know, these were considered combatants and there was a sort of a, the, the pool of reciprocity, etc., which uh, kind of briefly highlighted them for relatively preferred uh, treatment. So um, I, I, the, the, there's a lot of historical work uh, to do, and I'm, 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 you know, relying on work that has been done by uh, by others. What the First World War introduced a, a, a really dramatic change in that, uh, for the first time, colonial troops were deployed en masse to uh, the battlefields, uh, particularly as some imperial powers overcame their resistance to do this, and and uh, uh, you know the British were. Uh, uh, um, you know, more resistant than the French to deploy um, Indian troops on the uh, front line. The French, by comparison, uh, were sort of very keen uh, on uh, deploying the Tirailleurs uh, Senegalais and the Zouave and various other African troops in uh, Verdun. And of course, you know, this was all very ambiguous, but the French, was, this was uh, doubly sold as part of a civilizing mission. Uh, on the one hand, the French argument was that colonial, you know, African troops had been civilized enough that they could now fight in uh, Europe, uh, you know, and that was obviously in, in uh, contradistinction to what had you know, traditionally been the belief, namely that, um, you know, savage uh, soldiers could not possibly uh, uh, participate in European warfare on an equal footing. Uh, and uh, in their sort of uh, let's say, uh, I mean, this, this French civilizational uh, superiority as um, indicated by France's ability to civilize uh, African uh, troops, then uh, gave France a kind of civilizational edge in its effort to civilize the barbarian Huns and, uh, you know, their Turkic uh, allies. Uh, so this had an impact, I think, on, on um, how prisoners of war were treated during the First World War um, on both sides in, in uh, 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 well, I mean, mostly on the German side. Uh, uh, so the Germans made uh, uh, prisoners of war from, uh, you know, uh, uh, white, but also uh, African troops, uh, Muslim troops uh, from North Africa. Uh, there was a kind of, in, in, in Germany, this led to a sort of anthropological, uh, and kind of biometric enthusiasm. So, uh, you know, um, uh, colonial troops were uh, sort of dissected for their uh, particular features and this, you know, it was uh, um, uh, a kind of uh, an opportunity uh, in, in a sense. Uh, they were, of course, they tend to be portrayed as particularly uh, savage, but nonetheless, uh, colonial troops were treated uh, remarkably well in uh, in Germany, uh, aside from this uh, uh, anthropological research, and one of the reasons may have been German efforts to um, rally Muslim troops and uh, 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 encourage French troops to uh, join uh, the German Turkish uh, uh, alliance. So, for that purpose, the Germans built the Zossen camp close to Berlin. Uh, where one of the first mosques uh, ever built in Germany was uh, constructed. And uh, the plan was largely unsuccessful. Uh, the uh, French troops sort of prioritized their um, French sort of imperial allegiance over 
uh, solid, you know, the, the temptation of fighting uh, for the uh, Turks. Uh, but this was a sort of uh, interesting um, precedent. Now, um, the next move by the Germans was uh, really to sort of annoy the British and the French to uh, then enthusiastically mix troops of different uh, uh, geographic and racial provenance uh, together. Uh, and uh, this was in protest of the British then uh, starting to send uh, uh, Indian troops in particular to the, the front. And um, the, the British protested this quite uh, uh, forcefully uh, and, uh, uh, you know, arguing that, that this was, um, that, you know, on, on various grounds that this was uh, uh, um, uh, uncalled for and that uh, white soldiers should not have to share barracks with uh, Indian uh, 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 soldiers. And uh, in fact, the British threatened to do the same, and they threatened to uh, mix German prisoners of war uh, with Turkish prisoners of war, uh, which, the, to, to, you know, which the Germans reacted to with horror. Uh, and so they desisted from their own uh, practice, making sure that, you know, so uh, of course, troops were segregated by nationality, but even within national uh, or, or the side they, they fought on, but then uh, quite clearly, uh, uh, a lot of different uh, accommodation based on their uh, ethnicity. Okay, so um, th this is kind of a First World War background, and I think it's important to uh, uh, to understand because it framed then conversations about the laws of war and race, uh, early conversations about race. You know, if implicit, not not in today's language, but but in the in the interwar uh, uh, language of the time. Uh, that went on for uh, quite some time and which were quite indecisive. So there was in the early 20s, and I draw heavily on Timothy Schroer's uh, kind of uh, pioneering work on this uh, forgotten, neglected episode in the history of the laws of war. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth and uh, you know, no one was really strongly committed uh, uh, either way, it seemed at, at first. Certainly uh, there's the idea that uh, uh, one should not be mixed with other nationalities, even though they were fighting on the same side. It was less clear whether there should be uh, a, a, uh, a, an obligation to racially segregate or a prohibition uh, of racially segregating. Uh, a part of the background was German, um, you know, uh, anxiety about you know, colonial uh, troops in the rural and, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, having children with a uh, German woman, etc. So, the, you know, the whole Nazi uh, hysteria about uh, sort of uh, uh, mixing of races, etc. Uh, in the event, to, to make this short, because I, I could uh, go on, the uh, uh, 1929 convention, and I have to say, this is like really until Timothy Schroer started working on this, is something that really uh, uh, no one was paying much uh, attention to. Uh, uh, Article 9 says belligerents shall, as so far as possible, avoid assembling in a single camp prisoners of different races or nationalities. Okay, so quite strikingly, at the heart of international humanitarian law in 1929. Uh, a, a kind of obligation to do what one can to essentially maintain racial segregation. Uh, you know, this is not uh, you know, what, what they teach you in uh, IHL 101, but I think really quite striking. Now, there were some, uh, there was a mix of reasons for this. I mean, one of them, Lord Fillimore and others, British lawyers after the First World War, uh, thought this was a kind of prophylactic health measure. So you don't want to uh, mix troops uh, that had served together, and but separately, and which might have been contaminated by typhus or tuberculosis to uh, then be together. So there, there's that classic, I mean, you know, almost Foucauldian sort of, uh, you know, kind of health uh, governance. Uh, but they were also, I think, just under the surface, uh, more sort of uh, communitarian uh, uh, argument. So one draft said that, you know, fathers, brothers, and sons should be uh, interned together, ideally. Uh, but then that sort of, you know, by extension, there was a sense that uh, 
you know, people of the same, um, you know, skin color should ideally be uh, uh, together. So that, again, is the setting, right, inherited from the First World War for the Second World War, right? Um, and uh, as you know, the uh, German, Germans uh, were incensed by France's use of uh, colonial troops. They were uh, well-documented instances of uh, massacres of uh, tirailleurs uh, Senegalais in 1940 by uh, the SS. Um, and, uh, but the question that arose in France was what to do with captured uh, colonial troops from you know, Senegal and Morocco, et cetera. Uh, most French soldiers were uh, released uh, after France's defeat and, and many sort of went back to their families but this, that option didn't seem available in the case of colonial troops, uh, partly for logistical and military reasons, partly because you know, they had been sent back to uh, Africa, they might easily have taken up arms uh, with the free French who were starting to make inroads into uh, uh, France's uh, empire. So about 70,000 were detained from Senegal, Madagascar and uh, into China, uh, and, and of course, North Africa and West Africa. Uh, and sent to uh, front stalags, which were sort of prisoner of war camps, you know, not, not uh, in, in Germany, but in sort of the uh, occupied uh, countries. And um, the, uh, so, you know, what's the record of, of those prisoner of war camps, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I think in some ways, at least that some of the uh, basic humanitarian protections held good. Uh, there were, you know, some who were released, some uh, colonial troops were released for um, propaganda purposes. And, you know, uh, uh, I think the, the, the conventions, uh, the 1929 convention provided a modicum of uh, protection. There's also, um, it's been said that socialization uh, in mixed camps, uh, particularly among South Africans had, uh, you know, some positive effects in terms of uh, Africans and English speakers, but also black troops, uh, you know, sort of learning to uh, live uh, together. Um, and uh, there are certainly instances of white officers, uh, for example, French officers taking the defense of their troops against uh, bad treatment. Having said that, uh, treatment of colonial troops was generally harsh. Uh, the uh, uh, Africans were targeted for, uh, you know, military uh, projects working in, in aerodromes and uh, ammunition production, but were dangerous and probably in violation of the uh, Geneva Conventions. And most importantly, I think uh, the uh, prisoner of war camps kind of revealed what I would describe as a sort of internal uh, racism involved. So the racism of uh, in mostly in that case, uh, the French uh, themselves uh, in how they dealt uh, with their own troops. So one quite striking thing that happened uh, in uh, uh, 1943, I believe, was that the Germans decided to entrust the uh, guarding of colonial true prisoner of war camps to the uh, uh, collaborationist French themselves. So the French ended up sending kind of white sentries uh, to guard their own troops as part of uh, collaboration. Um, and, you know, this was uh, against a background where Vichy was particularly adamant that, uh, you know, colonial troops should not be allowed uh, out of camps lest they contaminate French women, etc. Uh, and of course, this continued to some extent after liberation with, you know, uh, for example, the repression of Senegalese soldiers who protested uh, the fact that they hadn't been paid for all their years of captivity and sort of many were, were killed upon being returned. Many were in fact detained, you know, at gunpoint by the Free French uh, in uh, 1945. But another interesting dimension to all of this, and I don't want to speak for too long, uh, 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 and uh, uh, so prisoner of war camps acting as revelators of internal racism was the US experience. So the US hosted on its uh, territory, uh, you know, in the Midwest uh, or in the West, uh, quite large numbers of Italian and US uh, prison and German prisoners of war. 
and uh, blank GIs were uh, struck, and we have considerable testimony to that effect by the fact that uh, German and Italian prisoners of war were treated better than they were. Right, so many instances of uh, 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 black uh, soldiers finding, you know, instances of fraternization uh, in uh, between uh, uh, the captors and prisoners of war, um, you know, enjoying their common whiteness, as it were, um, even as uh, black soldiers were uh, prohib prohibited uh, as a result of, uh, uh, you know, U.S. Uh, segregation from entering areas that were for whites uh, only. So maybe I'll finish with uh, the kind of fascinating uh, uh, question I uh, uh, quite related of uh, Jewish uh, prisoners of war during the uh, Second World War. So uh, obviously many uh, US, uh, British, French, Polish Jews uh, fought in the Second World War under you know, the flags of their respective countries. Uh, up to 9,000 US Jewish uh, prisoners of war were detained in Germany. There's a lot of nervousness among uh, Jewish uh, uh, US soldiers about you know, whether their dog tags might reveal their Jewishness, what they should do. Um, and uh, you know, some were sent to concentration camps. Uh, uh, about 350, for example, were sent to Berger from various uh, Stalags. Uh, the US after the war told them to sort of, you know, keep silent about that experience. And I think the fear was that the Americans had in some cases not done enough to intervene and, and uh, protect them as uh, US combatants rather than uh, uh, Jews. Uh, you know, the ICRC was also much criticized by the World Jewish Congress as having been a bit, uh, you know, dilettante about that danger. And uh, particularly in the uh, final days of the war, uh, the, the um, you know many interventions were made to the ICRC to say don't allow the Germans to separate Polish Jewish prisoners of war. We know exactly where this is uh, headed, and you know the ICRC was like, well, you know, if the 1929 convention does, it isn't super clear that you know you can't do that. Um, but you know, having said that, what's really fascinating is not maybe that story, but that at least for, and I should emphasize this for Western uh, uh, Jewish prisoners of war, um, you know, uh, many uh, uh, were not uh, deported, were not, um, uh, you know, uh, separated from uh, their fellow uh, servicemen, and of course they ended up being, you know, much better treated. Uh, than uh, their relatives in Europe. So you had so French uh, Jewish prisoners of war who survived uh, the, the, the war when their families in France uh, uh, did it. Uh, and now that's, I think, partly because uh, occasionally, um, you know, uh, officers sort of stood, stood by their men. And, you know, there's a famous incident where uh, U.S. Army uh, Sergeant Roddy Edmonds ordered uh, prisoners in, in uh, his Stalag to sort of, uh, after the Germans had asked uh, for Jewish uh, soldiers to uh, uh, identify themselves, you know, at all uh, men uh, stood up and say, well, all Jews. And as a result, the Germans sort of gave up on uh, at least for a, a time on that particular attempt. Um, so anyhow, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not sure where this is going, but I, I think um, there's, there's interesting post-war developments that one could uh, look into. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, South Africa and Angola, sort of Angola taking um, uh, white South African prisoners of war and how that was really a shock at the time, uh, you know, in terms of kind of reversing uh, or, or challenging racial hierarchies. Uh, I, I, it, you know, to me, it's really interesting, bottom line, that international humanitarian law first has a history of dealing with these questions, which is very intimate, very problematic, uh, and quite uh, forgotten. Second, that bizarrely, as a result of being artifacts of these weird international humanitarian uh, protections, uh, you know, racialized combatants occasionally benefited from better treatment than they might, uh, than uh, non-combatants might have, or even than they might have benefited from uh, at home in their own country. 
and I think that's a legacy that you know is worth uh, re-exploring, uh, re you know critiquing and reappropriating at the same time because I think uh, it shows that you know not all these conversations were first and foremost human rights conversations. Some of them occurred uh, you know in 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 the midst of war. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, again, uh, both presentations, you know, they just uh, reflect what I was I said at the beginning, ways of seeing. It provides you and Christian provide us with a different way of seeing things. And especially, you know, when you were mentioning the humanization of international humanitarian law going back and forth, it shows a more complex and nuanced uh, history or picture. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to to reading your this, where it goes, all these things. But definitely, you know, race and IHL is something underdeveloped. So thanks a lot for that. Now, on that note, uh, Devika will uh, conclude this panel. Hi, Devika. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, despite being away and outside, uh, and uh, uh, you will talk about something that uh, I think also extremely interesting. And thank you very much for being with us on abusive internationalism. And after that, you know, I will try to put all these presentations together and open the floor. So, Devika, thank you very much. Devika from London School of Economics. No need for further introduction. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> Maria has done the most wonderful job. Uh, at finding a date that suits almost everyone. And so I, I have to apologize. I am coming at you from half term uh, where I'm in the deep in the English countryside. I'm very nervous because there is no internet here, but apparently if I sit on the edge of the, the veranda, the neighbors reaches me. I literally have had to move because I was in the way of a bumblebee flight path. So in some ways this is quite idyllic, but in other respects, it is about terrain and it's quite cold. That Shakespeare sonnet, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? I often think she must have been, his lover must have been cold and a bit wet, really. But um, anyway, here I am. So um, I am speaking about abusive internationalism. Again, Maria's fabulous invitation, which allowed us, I think, all of us, of course, many of us are thinking about this all the time in their research. Recent events, of course, have, have had us reflecting perhaps uh, in a more intense way than usual uh, around war. And for me, this concept of abusive internationalism uh, has been two words uh, that I've, I've, I've sort of been thinking about and thinking, oh, I'd quite like to write a, a piece exploring uh, this idea. Uh, and so we've gone from Fred's very fine grained, historically situated um, discussion, Christians, you know, wonderfully thoughtful interrogation of self defense. Mine really is now quite abstract and, and, and a work uh, that I um, am interested to pursue. So it stems from this idea, of course. Uh, quite the converse of Louis Henkin's almost all states observe almost all principles of international law almost all of the time. Um, you know, conceding therein, of course, that, that some states violate some principles of international law some of the time. So the question, though, that I'm interested in is whether all violations are equal. So violations can be latent um, or blatant. Uh, they can be tolerated or they can be condemned. They can be minor or they can be grave. They can be perpetrated in good or bad faith. But all we really have in international law is this binary of legal, illegal. Uh, the only classification we still have by which to distinguish international law's violations. And because violations, as we know, in international law are only rarely considered by courts, there's no real way for us to assess or compare the severity of violations. And a particular quirk of international law is that violations, and I'm quoting, I think probably Tom Frank here, could be Harold Coe, uh, can be both law breaking and law making. Uh, so most violations are dressed up as legal justifications, and some of those purport to establish new interpretations of international law. And actually Christian's work has very much inspired me here, uh, actually going back to his discussion at more of the complicity idea um, in terms of self-defense. So I'm interested 
in in exploring whether we can differentiate between violations that are illegal and those which may legitimately lead to the establishment of new principles of international law. And this question seems fairly fundamental to our understanding of the development of, of sources of international law. Yet this characterization or the characterization and effect of international laws violations remains, as far as I am aware, fairly understudied. So I've been quite interested in the last few years in my research with the phase between becoming and being a legal principle. And I find that that's largely neglected in our discipline that focuses mainly on the identification of international law. And I'm using there the term, of course, of Michael Wood's uh, project in the International Law Commission. So I've seen a question from Ralph Wilde. So I hope you're still here, Ralph, because your work has also very much inspired my thinking around this. Um, so a sideshow to Russia's aggressive war against Ukraine has been a debate uh, about the connection between Russia's violations of the prohibition on the use of force and those of the West. And I use that term uh, and, and, and expect to receive criticism for it. It's obviously a, a fairly uh, difficult term. But if I could, the West's carapace of outrage about Putin's invasion of Ukraine hasn't protected it from outrage by those who argue that the West's recent in invasions disqualify it from taking a legal position on Putin's aggression. So, and we've all seen this, I'm sure, no one was more surprised than George W. Bush when he became the most famous voice to condemn the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq in the context of the debate about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So coming back to Ralph, more deliberate and thoughtful charges have been made by a range of scholars. And I've seen, of course, Nico Krish as well. And there, there are others uh, who argue that it's sheer hypocrisy for governments responsible for invasions of Iraq, Afghanistan and the former Yugoslavia to condemn Putin's aggression against Ukraine. But others have pointed to the danger of a sort of injustice cascade, arguing the West violations have sort of caused or, or paved the way for those by Russia. But on the other hand, there are those who argue that it's misinformed to suggest that any action contravening international legal rules uh, have the same legal significance as any other. So we've seen uh, many of us, I'm sure, the statement by the European Society of International Law that claim that the contention the West has no better record when it comes to respecting international law is a morally corrupt and irrelevant distraction and in any event offers no legal justification for the aggression that's been unleashed. So. In um, any piece that I write on this, I'd like to explore the idea of abusive internationalism with the aim of opening up a means of understanding a greater spectrum of international illegal conduct. So here we leave to the side, I'd suggest, blatant violations where the violator doesn't seek to deploy international law at all. But instead, the concept would apply to circumstances where the violator relies on international law, um, distorting, abusing, or perhaps legitimately extending international legal principles to fit the violating conduct. So the aim would be to see if, if we can establish legal metrics by which to assess the use and abuse of international law and to distinguish violations that might perhaps at best justifiably lead to the development of new international legal principles uh, from those that at worst indicate an aggravated violation. So the hope would be to recharacterize what otherwise has been construed largely as international laws problem, which has led at times to its dismissive characterization as a grab bag of rules that actors dip into when they need a norm to justify or add legitimacy decisions already reached on other grounds. Um, so the idea would be that abuse of international law became something for which violators uh, were held accountable rather than international law itself. In identifying an appropriate spectrum of abuse, uh, it's helpful to understand where this might sit in the context of our existing understanding of um, the concept of international law. The mainstream positivist approach to the interpretation of international law focuses for the most part on the question as to whether the law has been validly posited, directing attention to the qualification of the authority identifying the law. 
Therefore, our focus in determining the validity of customary international law is on whether the relevant principle is consistently supported by widespread and representative number of states. However, while positivism aspires to the exactness of a legal science, law is importantly distinct from the usual object of scientific inquiry. And I really like Monica Garcia Salmonas Rivera's uh, recognition in, in her wonderful book uh, that law doesn't spring into existence unintentionally like mushrooms in the woods or stones in the earth. Law instead is by its nature incomplete and indeterminate and in perpetual transition to its finite attainable ideal. So acknowledging law's indeterminacy leads to recognition that legal method requires more than a descriptive process and necessarily entails that creative element. And the positive method doesn't deny that possibility, but nevertheless has not yet paid sufficient attention, I would argue, to the space between the creation and ascertainment of the law, making it a less than optimal method in the international legal setting where law's authorities are typically plural, decentralized and disconnected. So to bring this back to this concept of abusive internationalism, this would shift law's Archimedean point from a focus on authority to a focus instead on purpose. In terms of orientation, it connects with recognized principles of international law, including principles of good faith and abuse of right. Wolfgang Friedman and Vaughan Lowe have both discussed the way in which principles of equity can be deployed to encourage the development of, a more, precise, of more precise principles that can serve to materially alter the whole character of international law and its relation to the most pressing problems of fairness and justice. The principle of good faith can be regarded as a sort of constitutional principle of the UN Charter found in Article 2, which sets out the principles in accordance with which the organisation and its members are required to act. In interpreting this principle, the ICJ has deployed the criteria of relationship to purpose as a yardstick for deciding what good faith requires in any particular case. The principle has been described as having the function of assuring the primacy of common aims over manifestations of excessive individualism by states which are incompatible with them. And one other principle I'm interested to explore, again, if I am able to bring this all together in some form of written piece, um, is uh, something that's developed out of that obligation of good faith, being the prohibition of abuse of right, which has been recognised as a general principle of international law. And again, that principle encourages attention to the purpose of a right in assessing its legitimate exercise. According to Bin Cheng, a reasonable and bona fide exercise of a right implies an exercise which is genuinely in pursuit of those interests which the right is destined to protect and which is not calculated to cause any unfair prejudice to the legitimate, legitimate interests of another state, whether these interests be secured by treaty or by general international law. So principles such as good faith and abuse of right uh, serve as legal markers, I'd argue, for conduct that oversteps what can otherwise be quite an imperceptible line between impropriety and illegality or between discretion and arbitrariness. So what I would hope to do is to bring this sort of theoretical and abstract discussion uh, into uh, the realm of aggression. Uh, and to, to consider whether we can develop some spectrum by reference to uh, various violations of the prohibition on the use of force through the years. Now, Maria, I haven't asked you this, but I'm not sure if I can share a screen. Can I do that? Yes. Hi. Is it raining, Davika? It is raining. Yes, it is. <laughs> no, it's, it's rather, rather amusing. The last time I had a situation like this, I was actually in quarantine and I was sitting in a shower giving a presentation, but didn't disclose that. And the shower started dripping on me. So I'm hoping to suggest I'm being professional by sitting in this downpour. Um, feels anything but. Okay, so I'm not sure, is, is my screen shared? Uh, yes, yes, we can see it. Yes. Okay, sorry, is that hopefully a spectrum that you're seeing? Uh, yes, yes, the spectrum. Yeah. yeah. So, so, oh, sorry, hang on. For some reason, I am the only one who can't see that screen. But anyway, um, it just seeks to sort of, again, in a very roughshod way, suggest this spectrum uh, by which uh, we might consider um, the characterization of violations uh, by reference to the purpose 
uh, that they purport uh, to serve. Uh, and again, this is, is not about determining whether something is legal or illegal, uh, but in terms of assessing these principles or purported principles of international law and whether that might be seen uh, as a legitimate uh, interpretation of international law or not. So you'll see I very loosely here in this spectrum broken down the idea that we might look at the idea of, uh, of, of uh, violations that do purport to enforce an erga omnes norm as perhaps uh, sitting on an end of the spectrum that might be more legitimate. Uh, and then coming down the scale, you know, a purpose where it's the enforcement of international law, the enforcement of an international legal value. I've actually already done a bit of writing on this with the concept of necessity uh, in draft form, which is where uh, these ideas have started to come together. The enforcement of ideology, we're getting a far more controversial here, but Tom Ginsburg's recent book uh, on the idea of democratic and authoritarian versions of international law, I find so, so compelling but problematic uh, and therefore really interesting but but you know I want to explore a little bit more that idea of enforcement of ideology uh, then enforcement of state interests enforcement of unlawful purposes and what I'm suggesting is more a criminal purpose while fully acknowledging that idea of uh, criminal violations has been rejected certainly in the drafting of the articles on state responsibility but but we're getting down that end of the scale. And when we look at this definition of aggression, the character, gravity and scale, I really think that interpretation of character uh, really needs to be far more attached to purpose. Um, and, and I'd look to sort of, sort of build that out more, as I say, in any, any piece that I write. So you will be appreciated, I'm sure, the inchoate nature of the thinking around this. Uh, but thank you, Marie, for the opportunity. Uh, I hope uh, I will have to flesh this out a bit more. The children are descending <laughs> as we speak, so I'm going to quickly go on mute. Um, but thanks very much. Um, and I thank will... you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us with the rain and uh, and everything. Uh, when you were talking about the abuse of rights, I was thinking of my uh, co-patriot Nicolaus Politis. You know, in the interwar period, he wrote a lot of ab on abuse of rights and especially related to use of force. Uh, so, uh, having uh, said that, now I mean, it, again, what can I say? Um, new perspectives, uh, things. Uh, to problematize, to make us think a lot. Uh, somehow, I do find this common thread between among the three uh, presentations, although they come from a different, more doctrinal, uh, historical, or, or normative um, uh, perspective. However, you know, I would like to give uh, to open the floor and uh, to give um, uh, participants the opportunity, you know, to 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 ask questions. Uh, they told me that you cannot raise your hand and take the floor so basically you know i don't know if you have if anyone has any question you know uh on uh, who would like to put on the q a or any of the participants now to initiate you know uh the the discussion so maybe devika can you can you uh remove the sharing maybe because i cannot yes great okay so uh, are there any questions, someone who would like to comment uh, on uh, or, or raise a question to any of our uh, speakers uh, for now to start? Okay, I can see. Um, no comments. Well, um, if I can, uh, I can take the opportunity then, you know, uh, I was thinking since Eliav is still here with us, Eliav, I don't know if you can, if, if you can talk, okay, you can talk, uh, because you and Christian both, you know, you talked about the, the concept of self-defense, and somehow, you know, I think it was, it was quite complementary, you know, uh, both your presentations to some extent uh, of, um, um, Somehow, actually, I think Christians was a kind of an abusive understanding of the concept of self-defense, you know, uh, and, and how it has uh, developed. I wonder, you know, whether you would like 
uh, I throw the ball to, to, to you now uh, to, to initiate uh, this discussion, especially also with uh, uh, Devika's um, intervention, you know, of this concept of, of abusive uh, internationals. I know, uh, Elia, you, we know each other for many years, so you, you won't be upset for putting all the hard job on you, you know, so any, any thoughts on that while you were thinking? No, I mean, uh, there was a lot to think about, whether I was uh, just Christian. Uh, I really found, you know, compelling and uh, in, in thought-provoking what you said about, uh, about the cost of, of framing everything, funnel, funneling everything through self-defense and whether... You know, the upshot of it is that we we actually widen the possibilities of resort to force in relation to, you know, previous iterations of the same actions. And I was wondering what, I mean, so, so what, so, so what do you, do you think, uh, so what's the alternative to, do you think, you know, would there be some advantages in reintroducing these concepts? I know you said that, that you're not suggesting it, but I was kind of wondering uh, um, whether you know somebody should make an argument. Yeah, let's just dump unwilling or unable and just uh, discuss it in terms of, of hot pursuit and what would be the costs. That's, that's one thing. The other thing, you know, that I kind of chatted with uh, Fred uh, in private. Um, a bit was an, and maybe you can open it up. Others might be interested. So I was wondering what's, and I don't know if Boyd is still here, uh, but it was striking to me that the, in 1949, the, the Third Geneva Convention, so it doesn't include the segregation clause for uh, uh, POWs, and it's, gonna, it's really interesting to see whether, you know, the human rights discourse or whether desegregation of the military in the U.S., what contributed to the fact that 1949 doesn't have the segregation. So, so it's only 20 years, right? From 29 and 49. And 49, this thing, you know, ceases to exist. So I was wondering what, what's your take on that? Yeah. Maria, we're awaiting orders as during the break. No, 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 please. Uh, no, I was about to take you have the floor, Christian. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I've uh, procedurally occupied it. Now I'm stuck with it. Good. I mean, Eliab, look, I don't know. Uh, I think sort of, uh, and I, look, I mean, we're all caught um, in, in the, the limits of the discussion. I mean, just imagine if today you suggested, I mean, you or I suggested that all the self-defense against terrorists should be looked at from another perspective. Let's, let's look back to what the South Africans developed as a sophisticated argument in 1976 and 19. I mean, it's sort of, it's professional suicide. Um, I, I, not, not because they did, I mean, not, but I think, uh, so this is why I was hesitant to say it. So I don't see this working. And also it's of course that the, the cost argumentatively, whether you're, I mean, as an academic, you can try whatever, but just imagine if you were, I mean, I don't want to reduce international law to how would you advise the state to sort of make the argument. Just imagine if you are advising a state who is worried about, um, who is keen to use force against terrorists because it thinks that that's the right thing to do and wants legal cloth or legal justification for that. And that's your job. Could you, could you even spend a second suggesting that it might be hot pursuit? I think you, it's completely nonsense. I mean, it's a complete non-starter, even though it may not be nonsense. What I, what I think the problem is that the discourse on the use of force is always in this holier than thou, let's not get there, where does this lead to level? So you cannot admit the possibility that use of force prohibitions could be anything other than general. You cannot permit the possibility that the limitations, the, let's say the, the bulk of Article 2.4 that speaks about political integrity, territorial integrity, or the, or the UN Charter purposes and principles or, could be a limitation. Um, you have to go with it because that's, I mean, I don't know. I mean, who is to argue that this is a civil, civilizatory advance to have a, a general ban on force? Um, 
it's so difficult to argue that um, even, even where you have uh, sort of the, the plausible claim to the moral high ground and humanitarian intervention, it's so difficult to argue in a, certainly in a European doctrinally focused, I don't know, charter affirming paradigm um, of, of discussions. It's so difficult to argue that you should admit exceptions outside the textual, uh, the textual parameters of the charter. Um, I mean, I don't know, I've, I'm not, I mean, I'm probably perhaps I'm, the, I'm sure I'm the oldest in this on this talk. I've, I've sort of I don't know. I've lived through a '90s hysteria. I've lived through sort of realist backlash, but at no point would it be in in my European, whether that British, English, or German settings, have been plausible to say, "Look, this is all nonsense. We're doing international law a disservice by insisting on the all-encompassing scope of the use of force. We're doing international law a disservice." by restraining the number of available exceptions. It's so difficult to even make it past the first line of argument with that. So I say what I'll say now with a lot of hesitation. And I think that the only point I'm making is that it comes to bite us. Um, if, you don't, if you don't go with the sort of, I declare nothing can be allowed unless it's self-defense and I, and I define what self-defense is, namely a super high level of armed attack and only against states. So if you don't, if you're not a believer, as it were, and if you feel that you need to sort of somehow accommodate the diversity of practice, then the minute you go down the self-defense route, you're stuck. You're making your life more difficult. I mean, you can always rule out that anything taken, any measure against terrorists taken in the last 60 years could not validly be self-defense. And I think you win purity of argument and analysis. But of course, you lose, lose completely 60 years of practice, which is first Israel, then the US, then Portugal, and since then it's 50 states or 100 states. And you can, you can perhaps, um, if you want to somehow deal with that practice, then I think dealing with it on the territory or terrain of self-defense is the worst you can have if you want to, if you want to hedge it in. So I, I'm tempted by this argument. Let's come up with an alternative uh, explanation that is not as open-ended or as open to abuse as self-defense. And that doesn't come with a connotation that Self-defenders are the good Ukrainians whom we cannot control or whose, whose use of force we must be, must be finding not just lawful, but legitimate and, and, and justified at all levels. But I mean, I, I've, not come with, up with a, I've not come up with a sort of a good alternative explanation. And the ones that have been tried, I think, have been, have been thoroughly displaced. So I see no plausible basis. I mean, I... I just, so the point was to diagnose the cost of it. Uh, sorry, I've, I've probably spent a lot of time now rehashing what I said before, but uh, it's, it's more, I mean, no, I'm not gonna make the argument. I, I see the abstract appeal, but I, I don't see it working anywhere other than as a, as a, as a sort of professional seppuku. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, Fred, uh, can yeah. I, yeah, I would like first to give the floor to Devika because her sure. internet sure. might be cut. So Devika, there was a, a, a question for you uh, from Chris and then uh, there is something, did you, could you read that on Q and A? No, you couldn't. So we cannot hear you, but I can, I can read it for you. Uh, so Chris says a super interesting pro project. Thanks for the presentation. Okay, the question is what, what hangs on the distinctions made on your spectrum? Uh, condonable slash uh, well-intentioned aggression or blatant unjustified aggression, an issue of different state responsibility or can one contribute more or less to the development of the law? I don't know, is that, do you hear me? And I think there is one from uh, Luigi, uh, oh, but it's actually addressed to everyone. Uh, he says uh, to Devika or whoever wants to add a bit of controversiality, can scholarly silence or some inconvenient issues become integral to abusive internationalists such as the Monroe Doctrine, inadmissibility under the UN Charter and sovereign quality more concretely, uh, threats of war against the Solomon Island vis-a-vis -vis and simultaneously sacralization of states, self-determination in case of NATO accession. Don't we run a risk of an international law good for the enemy only? Oh, wow. Easy questions, guys. And not abstract at all. So um, I don't know who would like. Devika, would, can you take the floor? Yeah, terrific. Thank you so much, um, Chris and Luigi and and. 
hello to you both. Um, so, Chris, initially, certainly, this is about, um, for me, the problem of the indeterminacy of international law. Uh, and so it is largely about how short of, because customary international law does not come into existence instantaneously, how do we deal with that phase again, sorry, that I'm calling between becoming and being a legal principle? And so I've looked at this through three lenses, uh, one of which is uh, a focus on the community of states. And I'm drawing here on Judge Simmer's um, uh, contrast between, and sorry, I don't have it to hand, but I think in Kosovo, he talks about the distinction between uh, tolerated, condemned, and, and perhaps I've got this language wrong, but as far as you know, I'm, I'm gleaning how widely uh, supported it is uh, within the international community. And Luigi's point here is, is really interesting to me that, that and, and you know, inspired by projects such as uh, Nas, Modizadeh, and um, Denai Azaria on state silence, uh, that yeah, actually many states do not actually <laughs> have voices in, in this forest. So we do get that problem that's raised by Ralph and others um, that you know it really is only a few states that we're hearing from so you know an alternative um and and bashak charlie's done some really fascinating work on the authority of international law looking at the authority of the principle itself is it strong weak or rebuttable um and i, I beg your pardon because i'm getting into a much broader project i'm doing at the moment on positivism or broader paper i'm doing on positivism uh where i look at law as basically community plus purpose plus authority. And I really feel that purpose is, is something we need to tap uh, more deeply in understanding uh, the impact on the development of international law. This is a very long way of answering Chris's very pithy question that yes, I do see this largely as contributing uh, to our understanding of where this fits in terms of, again, the, the enterprise that Christians engaged in, in, in looking at what principles of international law should ultimately regulate. Uh, but we've got this hugely untapped phase of, of before they are recognised as legal principles. Uh, and it is one to which scholars such as Christian contribute. And I've just been doing a, uh, got been to a conference on 20 years uh, after Afghanistan and engaging with this question of self-defence and its variants, uh, as I was calling it. But you know, how, how do we uh, engage with what interpretations of self-defense uh, we uh, give any credence to? Uh, and do we have any metrics by which we can assess that? Sorry, I, I, that was a very long-winded uh, quasi answer. Uh, thank you very much, um, Devika. I don't know, Christian, would you like to, to add something or? So they give the floor to Fred. Christian, I don't want you to be forced to. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll feel like I've, I just I've rambled. I've, I've spoken too much and rambled far too much. So maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll just ask for now. Okay. Well, I'm going I'm to ask Christian very quickly. His, his paper on complicity, how that fits with this recent intervention on hot pursuit. I mean, are you because I saw through that paper you were really looking at a broader interpretation of self-defense there, a more expansive. Whereas here I, I hear you and I, I apologize I, I wasn't in the best setting to be in, um, engaging with with the finer aspects of your argument, but you're saying no that we need to narrow it further. Okay, so then to that I think no I, I mean. I've always thought on, on this big question of sort of could there be self-defense against non-state actors, it was um, the better argument was that you couldn't rule it out and there was sufficient practice uh, despite the gray areas that I think condoning, non-condoning that, um, and there was sufficient pedigree to the practice to sort of consider it as plausible self-defense. But I think that was more, um, that was more sort of almost like a resigned take and perhaps somewhat provoked by the fact that others I felt were too easy and too quick in dismissing it. Now, what I meant today was that I think it's not wise pragmatically to be treating anti-terrorist measures as self-defense because then you can no longer rein them in. And what might be 
permissible under my moral compass as a, as a limited measure of limited reach um, was far more difficult to control if it came under self-defense because self-defense comes with such vague, uh, ill-defined boundaries. Uh, and I felt that had that debate about the measures taken be had on the, on the let's say, under a different rubric, not self-defense, it could have been easier to control the real problem, namely the overreach, the, the use or abuse of self-defense for long-term campaigns that initially might have been plausible instantiations and invocations of self-defense in my view, but then over time became, uh, became well, I mean, like all these invocations of self-defense became so difficult to justify. So, uh, so it's perhaps not, um, I mean, I, maybe it's a contradiction, but perhaps I would, I would look at it as a sort of a reflection from two, two different standpoints. One is, what do I make of a particular self-defense argument and which construction do I prefer? And the other, am I happy with the general thrust of the discussion? And I think you could probably sense from that that I'm not happy with the idea that everything is funneled or channeled through self-defense. Thank you very much, Christian. Fred, uh, you have the floor. There is a question to you addressed by Professor James Tao. Uh, sure. Um, oh, can you see the q and I ask you or not? No, I'm uh, sorry, I'm uh, looking at it now. Can okay. I just go back quickly to uh, yeah. El Eliav's uh, yeah, yeah. question? So, okay. of course, the, the end of, uh, of that story is, is 1949, and I didn't go, get there. And, um, you know, Article 22 uh, says, the detaining power shall assemble prisoners of war in camps or camp compounds according to their nationality, language, and custom. So language and custom became signifiers for, you know, community proximity. I think that there was a sense, I mean, you know, racism, you know, as we know, kind of can masquerade in, in, in all kinds of ways, right? So I think using race was simply no longer available in 1949, especially after the, after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, there, there was a sense, it's almost like a communitarian argument, right? But prisoners of war uh, should be uh, uh, jointly with people they can sort of, uh, you know, whose language they understand and they can uh, interact with in ways that are fulfilling. So one thing, you know, Eliav had asked me whether desegregation in the US uh, had any effect. It's of course, it, a little early for that. Uh, but, but I think certainly evolving ideas about uh, racial equality uh, would certainly have been uh, influential over, you know, that the, the work of sort of tracing uh, you know, these uh, influences is still to be done. So, uh, sorry, I'm reading the questions now. Uh, uh, what uh, things? Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that, that could be true. Uh, interesting. I mean, um, be interesting to know what Lieber's ideas about uh, all of this uh, were, and, and I think that's something to, uh, to look into. Uh, you know, I mean, okay, let me just say this as a methodological point. I think on the one hand, we have the treaties, the conventions, and what they say and all that they don't say. On, on the other hand, we have uh, the many, many ways in which uh, in practice uh, and on a very micro level, issues of race, uh, racial affiliation, ethnicity, were constantly being negotiated and renegotiated. So I guess my call is uh, sort of uh, maybe as a broader point, right? to depart from, uh, you know, although I engage in them as well in my own time, but from some of these sort of mega uh, debates to look at sort of very detailed crystallizations of the law in particular circumstances, right? Uh, you know, not just because the devil is in the detail, but, but also because uh, norms, um, you know, much more than sort of written norms. They also implicit understandings, practices, um, habits, etc. That that sometimes are quite uh, revealing. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. Um, I don't know if there is any other uh, question. Something that I missed. 
uh, I can see comments on chat directly um, sent to you. Well, uh, if, of course, you know, we still have some time. However, you know, I know under the current conditions, especially the vehicle's exposure to, to, to the nature. Uh, while I was listening about abusive uh, um, uh, internationalism and, and going back also to, to, to Christian's um, uh, comments, you know, about uh, self-defense, I was thinking of, uh, yeah, we cannot uh, do a session without mentioning Koskinemi, I assume, but I was thinking about the culture of formalism. Uh, something, you know, that we usually don't pay enough attention, you know, uh, when we read about uh, Koskinemi, you know, we, we talk, we, we focus a lot on the indeterminacy, but then there are these uh, couple of pages, you know, towards the end that they are further developing the gentle civilizer where he talks about the culture of formalism, which for me, it's a call, um, I think it was, it was characteristic, it was, it was about the Granada invasion. And it was uh, on on abusive. Uh, um, it was a case of uh, of abusive internationalism, if you want, Davika. I can name it like that. And then there was a call, you know, for uh, legal advisors and for people, you know, to to try to kind of exercise a kind of judgment and remain within the limits of formalism acknowledging also the fluidity of this formalism. So uh, there was a problem, you know, with the culture of formalism because there were two concepts that they were very, very uh, questionable. And, you know, putting them together, you know, I think each of us can have a different understanding about that. But maybe, you know, when, when we look for an answer, and I don't want to look for answers, uh, but like when we feel a little bit hopeless, you know, about law and what we do, maybe, you know, if we go back to this understanding, you know, that there are some formalities that matter, and, you know, we all play a role in how we frame these formalities. I don't know at all if I make sense, but more and more, you know, my response to most of the things I write recently goes into this culture of formalism, you know, which goes back, you know, to us to say there is something there, there is some kind of form, which is not necessarily bad, okay, as long as we acknowledge that this form can be adapted. And this is maybe a response, you know, to abusiveness. If if I, if I if I can put it like that. Now um, on that note, you know, as you saw, I put the picture of Guernica. Of course, it's the most cliche thing when you do a panel on international law and war. Everybody says, "Oh, Guernica." Then we think about the famous, infamous episode outside the Security Council room uh, uh, just before the Iraqi invasion. But the reason I put the Guernica is because currently, as we speak, in Reina Sofia, the museum in Madrid. Uh, there is an exhibition called Rethinking Guernica. And uh, my um, uh, invitation to, to, to all of the participants and the speakers, and I know, you know, we all run very late now and we are very tired, is together with the ways of seeing, you know, these themes that they are underdeveloped or developed or overdeveloped, I don't know what to say, you know, is to rethink uh, those things. The same way, you know, that the Reina Sofia Museum calls us to rethink Guernica uh, decades later, you know, after the destruction of the Basque city. The same way I, I thought of this round table, you know, or and asking you to, to rethink some things that we all work. And I think think uh, both sessions, and I know everybody has to run, uh, they were very much, you know, around this, they, they, they developed around this sensibility, if you want to know. I think it's also a self-challenge of all of us. Like Christian says, I spoke for 25 minutes, and then, you know, I, I, I spoke for, like, I, one of his answers was like, okay, now I feel, you know, that uh, what I said before. And um, somehow, you know, I, I want to thank all of you I don't know what else to say. I think we need this kind of legal imagination and legal self-challenge and, and try to understand, you know, and sometimes it's okay to say, actually, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't have an answer. And maybe, you know, uh, just to, to, to problematize, to situate uh, a theme. And I have to say that I enjoyed very much this discussion. I want to thank all the participants for, uh, for being with us, with questions, with comments. Uh, it was really fresh. Uh, for David, it was also very cold, literally, being outside and, 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 and rainy. Uh, but um, 
It was a pleasure to be with you. I don't know what else to, to say. Thank you very much, Christian. Now, thank you very much, Devika. Uh, Nehal had to pick up his kids. I love the same. Uh, uh, Fred, something similar as well, you know. So you see, we are very, just the few of us. But uh, the rest of us, we will continue the discussion, you know. And I hope uh, this uh, different approach, you know, to pick a theme and, and try think how can we reflect in the very weird circumstances we live now, where that will take us. So on that note, I want to thank you very, very much, Christian and Devika, thank you. I want to thank all the participants for being here. Um, and I don't know if you would like to say something, but really, thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. Thank you, Maria. Wonderful of you to get us together for these discussions. I've just said in the chat. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christian. Thanks a lot. And uh... well, thanks. thanks to you. Congratulations on uh, to Devika for braving braving the storm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Christian suggested I'm like David Attenborough. I think we're. we're... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks to the audience. That's all great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much, and uh, we will be back soon. Thank you very much, all of you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao.